Spirit of righteousness kind of faith. Gird up your loins, kind of well, I suppose it's about that time. <laughs> It's about time to get started for the uh, the last installment of this year's SRS uh, lectureship. I'm I'm Dr. James Michael Crusoe, and uh, Dr. Harris asked me to uh, work with him this year in hosting or directing uh, the lectureship. Uh, we've got an outstanding program, and in just a moment, I'm going to introduce the moderator for the morning session. Uh, I want to thank everyone for um, watching Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And, uh, and getting up early is not Sunday morning, but early on Saturday morning and uh, to support uh, uh, the School of Religious Studies. I just sent Robin a text, man, the playlist uh, the songs that, that, that were selected uh, before we got started has been awesome. I, I need to get a copy of that playlist. And the song, Faithful to Famine, that jingle uh, was uh, written by my son, Corey. He got all his singing gifts from his mother. He didn't get any singing gift from me at all, but we appreciate him uh, for putting that together. And then last night I mentioned about Daryl Powell, who did the ads uh, in the background. Uh, we're gonna get started. At this time, uh, I want to uh, present uh, Brother Andrew Braxter, great young preacher, gifted, um, and uh, we look forward to what God is going to do with uh, Brother Braxter, and, and we're thankful for him accepting uh, the charge to uh, lead our morning services. Uh, after uh, Brother Braxter introduces our first speaker, well, he'll tell you what we're going to do after that. And then uh, after the pass the mic, uh, there'll be some instructions on the breakout rooms. But we've had a good time walking through Amos. I, I, I trust that our faith has been increased and uh, our love for the minor prophet Amos has been increased as well. So at this time, uh, we're turning it over to Andrew Braxter. Good morning, everyone. Um, it is a, a blessing to be with you all this morning. I pray that uh, each of you are doing well today. Let me begin by expressing my appreciation to the SRS staff, uh, to our president, Dr. Harris, and to our director this week, uh, Dr. Crusoe. Thank you for inviting me to come and to uh, share uh, a small part in this, this year's lectures. Um, I'd like to ask for Brother Johnny Shin, a SRS board member, if he will lead us in prayer at this time, after which I will return and introduce our first speaker and we'll have a selection and then uh, the floor will be his. So. Our brother Johnny Shin, if you will come at this time and uh, direct our hearts in prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity once again to assemble, to study your word through the method that we are doing it at this time. We're thankful, Father, that just be able to be here this morning. If I may say so, Father, I have a cup running over from the previous speakers we look forward to better things this morning. We ask your Father that they be ready to pass the word on out into the world and to our local communities, that it be received with receptive heart and open mind. And that if there something is said that will prick them to think that they may act upon this information that is given to them. We ask your Father to be with our leaders, Brother Harris and his team that has put this program on and we ask you to be with each member that are participating in the program this morning and has so 
We ask your Father to be with each one now as we go forward in preaching your word and that you be continue to be with us. Be with those that are speaking this morning. Be with those panelists that will be on the panel. And we ask you to be with all of us now as we continue to work through the hearing of your word. These and all blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Brother Shin, for taking us to the throne of God in prayer this morning. Uh, our first speaker is Brother Willie McCord from the 10th Avenue Church in Columbus, Mississippi. Uh, I have had the, the privilege of hearing him on several, several occasions, and uh, he is just an awesome speaker and, and an awesome, awesome gift to the body of Christ. We anticipate the message that he will be bringing on this day. So following this election, the next preaching voice you will hear will be that of Willie McCord of the 10th Avenue Church in Columbus, Mississippi. It's in my veins, Lord, it's in my veins, yeah, it's in my veins, down in my veins, while the blood, while the blood, blood is running warm in my way down in my way down, it's in my veins, yeah, in my Way down in my, yeah, in my, while the blood, while the blood is running warm in my, way down in my, well, I'm gonna sing, sing a little here, and I'm gonna sing, sing a little there, while the blood, while the Way down, way down in my, uh -huh. I got it down in my veins, down in my, while the blood, while the blood is running warm in my, way down in my, Well, we're 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 waiting on uh, Willie McCord, and uh, while we wait on him, we're going to go to Plan B. Uh, and here's Plan B. <laughs> plan B. <laughs> what is Plan B? Plan B is those who have been. Uh, we we want to make this interactive. We're, we're going to make it interactive this morning until we get to our our next session. Um, some of you have been on since Wednesday, and then some uh, tuned in one or two nights. Um, let, let's kind of make this interactive, if we can, Robin, uh, to those who have uh, who are on Zoom. Um, what, what stood out about Amos, the book of Amos? If you had one takeaway, and, and I guess probably what we'll do is um, if you'll use the uh, by raising your hand in in the chat bar, and uh, and then maybe Robin and his team can bring you on screen, and and I know some of y'all say it's Saturday morning. I ain't screen ready. <laughs> I'm not screen ready. But uh, while we're waiting on Brother McCord, and 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 perhaps if he does not make it, this will help us with our time. What what's a takeaway? Um, a takeaway, not so much of of the speaker, but the presentation. And, and that's one of the things that I was really uh, impressed with was the content uh, of each speaker uh, this week. So uh, we're, we're gonna open it up to those uh, who are, are on Zoom. And, uh, uh, and, and who wants to go first? A, a takeaway from uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and, and Friday. Uh, 
I'm so glad I don't have to sing this morning. Y'all, y'all better say something before I start going into my solo. <laughs> a, a takeaway, a takeaway from Wednesday, Thursday, or or Friday. We should know um, Amos a, a whole lot better uh, after walking through. Uh, any 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 takeaways? Any takeaways? Uh, while while you're thinking about that, some of the speakers are on, if there was something you didn't say that you wish you had more time to say, I, I see Brother Carruthers, Brother Gilbert, and they're going to be on. Uh, they're going to be on the panel. But it, was there anything in your your message that you didn't get around to saying, and uh, that you would just like to add in the uh, few minutes that we have before we actually get started? I'm going to ask Brother Gilbert, tell us a little bit more about, about your approach to, to your topic. And then Brother Carruthers, would you come behind him in that? Hey, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Dr. Crusoe. And uh, just good to see everybody this early morning. we got my coffee uh, ready here. Uh, and so, yeah, my, my approach to um, this, this topic when I first looked at it the other month, I was like, my goodness, what am I going to say? How am I going to do this? Uh, but after, of course, you know, reading it uh, about 12 times, <laughs> like we were taught and, um, and other versions and just kind of looking at it, it just, it, I just, I looked at it from the standpoint, um, I looked at Amos and one that, um, you know, of course, the Lord called, he wasn't a professional, you know, uh, prophet. Uh, and of course, you know, I came up in the, in the church, you know, I didn't go to school till much later on. And so I really could identify with just um, just being, you know, what I would say, you know, called by and through the church. And so I just wanted to uh, give bring, bring something that was very relatable to, I think, the, the average person who would be be listening and still have have some, you know, level, of course, you know, scholarship. I'm, I'm into that as well. Uh, and uh, and just really trying to pull out the fact that the people, they just, you know, perhaps didn't understand what God was, was trying to do. God was pleading with them. He was pleading with them to repent, to come back. You know, they were, again, his, his virgin, his wife, if you will, who had fallen and just wouldn't get up. Um, and um, and so that was kind of my my approach uh, to it, just to, ha- to help people see just, you know, even in, in the midst, in the thoroughs, in, in the midst of the impending destruction, God still had his hand out, you know, good. saying. Yeah, yeah, good job, you did a good job. In a moment, I'm going to ask Brother Graham to come on. He put something in the chat, but I want him to come on. Brother Carruthers, what, what, what was your approach to to your topic? You know, how, how did you, you know, what, what went through your mind as you was putting that sermon together? Well, thank you, Dr. Crusoe, and we certainly have enjoyed being here each night this week, um, and uh, particularly uh, thankful for the topic that I had dealing with the uh, the word and um, a famine of the uh, word contrasted with what the Book of Amos demonstrates is the uh, political or uh, the political and religious circumstances of these in northern Israel. They had riches when it comes to their uh, wealth, uh, rather their economic standing, they had riches. Uh, But then too, they had all of the uh, things that one would want to have uh, worship with that uh, would be, I guess, upper scale. When we talk about uh, inventing to themselves instruments of music, which was not a criticism of the instruments of music there. And of course, that text has been misused to, to say that, but what it was really a criticism of is the insincerity, insincerity of those who uh, were coming to God in worship. They were insincere uh, in their worship. They could put together fabulous worship. Uh, they had uh, financial means. And at the same time, there was um, economic injustice, social injustice 
uh, in northern uh, Israel. And um, what that brings focus to even in our generation is as um, we become professional in our worship, in our buildings, in our formatting of our worship services, of um, our platforms and our stages, uh, the good times that we have just in the worship hour, what becomes critical is what happens once we leave the, the worship hour and how committed we are to the uh, word. And the very thing that uh, Israel would need would be the word and Amos promises there's going to be a famine of the word. Uh, what would be particularly needed to, to recapture relationship with God would be missing. But of course, that emboldens, highlights, and underscores for us uh, how important word is to the people of God, uh, something that is forgotten in our generation and, and uh, that is the DNA of Churches of Christ. Word makes a difference. Word makes a difference in how we present ourselves to God and what we, what we practice. And I appreciate that from, from Amos' uh, address. Well, we'll hold some of that because we're going to talk about that in the panel. And and actually, what you and Brother Gilbert shared is is one of the concerns that I I hope we'll address uh, in the panel as well. Got a couple of people that made some comments. Uh, Brother Graham, can we bring Brother Jerry Graham on on screen and uh, just share publicly your comments? And uh, uh, can we bring him on? What what was your takeaway, sir, from? Uh, uh, the lessons that you heard. Give me a second. Uh, I'm, I'm not visually ready, but uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I'm, I've been enjoying uh, since uh, everything started. Uh, and I've always been amazed with the uh, preaching uh, from the prophets and, and uh, just to compliment everyone. Uh, there's some great preaching uh, series uh, that I've heard and uh, really impressed in light of what's going on in our world. Uh, a great, great messages about righteousness and mercy. Uh, we see a lot of unrighteousness and a lot of uh, uh, people being unmerciful, uh, but then we're called to that. And I, and I just thank God for uh, the messages from uh, these men of God. Uh, to bring us back to uh, a sense of righteousness and mercy. So uh, thank you all for uh, this lecture. All right. Thank you, Brother Graham. You, you, you know what this reminds me of? You know how how after Sunday morning service, boy, folk would say, boy, the preacher sure did preach. Oh, man. <laughs> boy, he preached. And then, yeah, what did he preach about? I don't know, but he sure sounded good, <laughs> you know? So... Uh, uh, I saw a couple couple comments in the chat. I, I know everybody may not be ready to come on uh, screen Saturday, Sunday, uh, Saturday morning. Sister Crusoe put something in the chat. And uh, let me see if I can find what she said. Um, uh, oh, her takeaway, righteousness. Yeah, yeah. She said righteousness is more than a feeling. And, um, and that... Uh, it is a life of obedience to to God. All right. I think I saw Sister Gilbert uh, had something in the chat. Sister Gilbert, do you want to come on screen, or you you want wanted to be read? It could be read. All right. You could have said just what you said. Okay. She says, stay in the center with the Lord. See, I, I, when I read this, I may not read it with the emphasis that 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 the person who uh, wrote it said a takeaway. Uh, we we just want a, a takeaway from um, those who have been on uh, all week. Just a takeaway. What 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 do you remember? I, I remember Doss. <laughs> Doss talked about being a relief pitcher, and that he he told that story about male male Femi. I I looked it up, you know, and 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 there there's some truth to that. And uh, Doc Doss, he just came through and uh, laid some things out. He had he had actually Amos chapter five uh, about the noise of vows and and those things being taken away and everything. 
But this is a quiet group this morning. Uh, Brother Gilbert, they didn't get their coffee yet. We, we got to get our coffee just, just to take away. If someone came to you, if someone came to you, um, a stranger, and just said, uh, I, I just picked up the Bible and I read through the book of Amos. I read through the book of Amos. Um, and I know you, Church of Christ. You remember, you remember the story how they used to tell about churches of Christ, members of Church of Christ being people of the book. And uh, I think as the story goes, like it was an old country courtroom in Tennessee. And um, they wanted to swear somebody in to take take the witness stand and, and they couldn't find a Bible. They could not find a Bible in the courtroom. And the judge looked out in the gallery and there were members of churches of Christ sitting in the gallery. Y'all remember that story? And I said, well, we, we may not have a copy of the Bible, but if we lay our hands on one of those members, that's like laying our hands on the Bible because there was a time when, when we quoted scripture, we, we knew scripture. So, the question that I'm going to throw out there is if um, if if someone came to you today, later today, and said, I, I just was reading through the book of Amos. And uh, what do you know uh, about the book of Amos? Um, what would we say, members of the church? It's an open, open form right now. What, what would you say about that? Let me see what that we... the Lord is powerful and that, uh, you know, just as powerful how he created the earth, he can also destroy it. And if man doesn't get right, um, he's going to there's going to be destruction for him as well. Um, so that's why you have to stay with the Lord and remain with him like um, the people. I guess that's why I said stay in the center because Israel was in the center of all of these these evil and wicked nations. But they were being influenced by by that and not staying with the Lord. Good point. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Gilbert. Sister Anita Thompson from the Arlington Road Church in Hopewell, Virginia. Uh, and then uh, Sister Patterson uh, or Anita Patterson. Go ahead, Sister Thompson. Good morning, everyone. I would say some of the background I remember uh, some of the preachers uh, giving that uh, Amos uh, lived in the kingdom of Judah, and that um, he preached in the kingdom of Israel, um, and his major things were of like social justice and about God's omnipotence and his divine uh, judgment. Good points. Good points. Yeah. Good, good. Good notes. You took good notes. You, we, we're gonna move you to the head of the class. You, you did real good, Sister Thompson. All right. Uh, Nita Patterson, uh, and then Patricia Price. I went back to see, uh, took on what, um, some of what I took from it in my notes. Uh, from the speaker one, I took, uh, come from behind the mask, I like that. And speaker two, I took uh, uh, from that was, uh, uh, there are people that do not see because they refuse to look. And from speaker three was uh, God is looking at it at the heart. Uh, from speaker four, I, I, I love the part where he was saying in worship, we're, we're singing well, but living wrong. Hmm. And uh, speaker five uh, was uh, God is trying to get them to wake up, which he's trying to get us to wake up as well. And speaker six, I took from uh, God is in control. Yeah, yeah, very good, very good, outstanding. I appreciate that. Uh, who's next? Uh, Sister Price, Patricia Price. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. What I got from it, um, starting off uh, the background of Amos being, um, I'm going to say, a common man from the country um, and how he um, studied and he boldly came to uh, the city and spoke to people who were doing well economically, uh, politically strong, but their hearts were hard. They turned away from God and the injustice just 
overflowed and they were not willing. And the result of that is that he was trying to warn them from the retribution that was going to come and that it parallels to what's going on now, the injustices, it parallels to uh, how we're doing well, but then God had to put us on a pause. He had to put us in a wilderness as he had to do with those people um, that Amos was warning them from, that the wilderness and the famine was going to come. And the purpose of wilderness and famine is for us to be cleansed, to, to, to be able, he wants to restore us. So he puts us through the wilderness. He puts us through the famine for us to prayerfully will come back to him. So that's what I got from that. All right. I, I think I think the Church of Christ has still got some some bragging power. You know, if folk come up and ask us, we got a word for them. Sister Taylor, Sister Mickey Taylor, I see your hand up. Uh, yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I, certainly, I thought all of the speakers were awesome. Uh, but Dr. Dose, he put it on the line by the time he even uh, departed from Amos and went to Second Chronicles and said, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, I, that was shouting stuff for me. Uh, but, you know, again, if you look back at Amos 4, how the prophet talked about, you know, it, it really mirrors the times we live in. Folks love to brag about what they're doing and what they got going on and how they give this and do this and they got their names and lights. And you know, God said, this is the kind of thing you love to do, but I'm not pleased with that. He, he talked about, I'm the one that brought all this on you. And if you look at what we're going through right now in famine times, people want to credit everything from the CDC to the news, to the media, to what have you, what, what's going on, but yet their hearts don't turn to God. God sat us down for a year where we had no company sometime, but the ability to keep his company. And still we kept fighting to get back to normal, which was not normal, which we were in error. And still we come back looking for the same thing. It's just like Amos went through that again and again. You keep doing this, you keep going back to that. And you just don't see what God is trying to show you. Well, 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 look, look, listen to New Jersey, New Jersey coming with it. Uh, now, if these preachers on the panel kind of drag their feet, I'm, I'm going to slip over to the women's panel this morning. Go ahead. Thank you, Sister Taylor. Appreciate that. Uh, I, I saw something from Dean Gentry. I, I don't know. Uh, are you able to come on? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? I, I, uh, I thought Brother Bert last night, along with my comment, uh, he captured, you know, God, God divided that Northern kingdom from the Southern kingdom, but he intended to keep it in the fold. And the fact that, uh, he sent a Southern prophet to a Northern kingdom, share the same message, same messenger, that theological premise in the new Testament, wherever the church is different locations, but they share the same message, the same messengers. And, uh, it, that that buttresses the unity and the call to what God wants. And uh, I thought uh, Brother Bird put that so together last night in terms of uh, bringing about what God, God did it, and he intended to save me through it. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, our fallenness is uh, problematic for us. But he did a great job. Great job. Yeah, yeah. All, all of the speakers did. Uh, Dr. Daniel Roberts uh, from Cameron Avenue, Colonial Heights, Virginia, you know, just gave us a good overview. William Jones, uh, uh, did y'all see him when he had that gavel? You know, he, he started talking about uh, justice and mercy and, uh, you know, he closed out with that. And, and then uh, Doc, uh, Dawson, Dr. Carruthers were just, just awesome. And last night was awesome as well. Well, I appreciate this. Uh, we, we, we're kind of uh, moving along here, and I had to be quick on, on my feet this morning. I, I know that um, uh, Brother McCord and also Brother Brownlee had funerals. They had funerals today, so we had to make some adjustments, but I think we're back on time now. We should be back on time. Uh, Brother Glenn, are you, Dr. Glenn, are you on? Uh, let, let's hear from you. Want to make sure you all. Yes, sir. I am here. All right. Good, good, good. Um, uh, Adrian Harper, Jr. Are you on? 
Yes, sir. We're here. All right. Good deal. And uh, Dr. Harris from Kansas City, you're here? Absolutely. Yes, sir. All right. Good. Yes, I, I'm going to transition now and give and give it back to uh, uh, Brother Braxter. And, and we're, we're, we're on time. We're on time. And uh, I'm excited about this Pastor Mike. Thank you, uh, brothers and sisters, for uh, sharing some insight of your takeaways from, from uh, uh, the book of Amos. And now I'll turn it back over to uh, Brother Braxter. All right, Dr. Crystal, thank you for, for leading us uh, through that last part. Um, being real quick on your feet, man, we really, we really appreciate, appreciate that. And thank you so much to everyone that shared during that time. Uh, I think one of the, the, um, one of the things that we look for uh, is judging our effectiveness, uh, especially in settings like this. And it's good to know that these messages uh, have been reaching everyone uh, at just the right place. As we go into this next uh, section, um, it's what Dr. Crusoe has called past the mic. Uh, we have three preachers who are going to preach from the same text simultaneously, uh, one behind the other. Uh, to, begin, uh, to begin, each speaker will have five minutes. Um, and at the conclusion of their time, uh, the next speaker will begin uh, where the previous speaker left off. Uh, each speaker will have five minutes to begin with. And then they'll come back with five more minutes, and then they will have a three-minute conclusion each. And we are really looking forward to the word that the Lord has placed on their hearts today. Our first preacher is a friend and brother, Dr. Nicholas Glenn, who serves the uh, Sharp Road Church in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, he is doing an absolutely amazing job there, and in January, he will he will have been with that congregation as the uh, senior minister for five years. We look forward to, uh, to Dr. Glenn, uh, Dr. Nicholas Glenn, my friend. Uh, following him, um, Adrian Harper uh, from Gainesville, Florida, the Southeast 10th Avenue Church uh, will be following him. Um, he is a powerhouse preacher. All of these preachers are great men of God in their own right, but I, I truly appreciate the approach uh, that Brother Harper takes uh, to each and every one of his messages. And then bringing up the rear, Dr. Archrell Harris, um, the, the singing minister of the uh, Roswell Church of Christ in Kansas City, Kansas, a church that I'm very familiar with and had the opportunity uh, to work with them uh, in my undergraduate years at Southwestern Christian College. Uh, Dr. Harris has a very unique way that he presents the word of God. We are looking forward to, to the message that he will share, um, that he will share on uh, this morning. So once again, once again, each speaker has five minutes to begin with. Um, when their time is up, we'll go to the next speaker and then we'll come, we'll go through that rotation again and then we'll close with three minute conclusions. Uh, let's get ready to hear the word uh, first from Dr. Nicholas Glenn. All right, well, good morning again uh, to all of those who are with us on today. We thank God for um, the opportunity to uh, share with you. Um, today, we thank Dr. Um, Crusoe for the invitation and Dr. Um, Harris for the work and all those who are assisting um, in this great effort um, of this great message uh, from the book of Amos. So good to see all who are on today. I um, appreciate uh, my friend and brother, um, Andrew, for the um, introduction and um, to the other uh, preaching ministers who are going to be coming with us. We are glad to share this platform with you um, on today. So we're going to ask you to meet us um, in Amos chapter seven. Um, this is uh, my first time on being on such a panel of Pastor Mike where we all have the same text. So um, if there's some overlap and just understand that that's the Holy Spirit, meaning that you need to hear something more than one time. Is that all right? So we'll invite you um, to, to Amos um, chapter um, seven. Of course, Amos being uh, one of the uh, 12 
uh, minor prophets, uh, minor not because of lack of importance of significance, um, but minor because of brevity and length. So in other words, um, you don't have to say a lot to say a lot. So I think that maybe that's what brother um, Dr. Caruso had in mind this morning. So y'all can say a lot, but don't have to say a lot. So we have five minutes and there's a counter already going. So let's get to it. Uh, what I want to do um, is kind of give a little historical refresh um, about Amos. Of course, we know um, uh, what's been kind of going on in, in Amos up to this point. Um, but I hopefully want to just quickly, um, quickly stimulate our minds um, to receive what is prepared for us in chapter seven. Uh, of course, we know that Amos penned this during the time where God's people were divided. Uh, you had um, the two tribes, you had um, the North tribe, you had the South tribe. And of course, Amos was in Judah, um, sending his message to the Northern kingdom. Um, what's important to know that during this time that Amos penned this message that um, both Northern and Southern kingdoms were in a period where they um, experienced peace and prosperity. Um, it is a good thing, y'all, to be in a place where you can experience peace and prosperity. Uh, when you experience peace and prosperity, you should be living good and it should be all good. Am I right about it? But, but I stopped by to tell you that looks can be deceiving. And just because um, it looks like something is good doesn't mean that that's the actual reality. So it is that the people um, experience peace and prosperity, but their peace and prosperity brought about and contributed to a spirit of greed and materialism. That their, their, their peace and prosperity uh, brought about oppression and exploitation. Their peace and prosperity followed fostered an environment where the rich oppressed the poor, where there was an atmosphere of self-indulgence and government and religious leaders became complacent and corrupt. People experienced peace and prosperity, but they did not acknowledge the source of their peace and their prosperity, which means they are now in a state of being spiritually bankrupt. I, I stopped by to tell you on this morning that you can have all the money in the world, you can have all the wealth in the world, all the prosperity, um, all of that, and still be broke as a joke because you can have all of that but when you fail to recognize the blesser who's been blessing you, you really don't have nothing at all. They were blessed, but their greed and materialism and exploitation, oppression, corruptness led to sin, and God does not like sin. So it is here that Amos is speaking as the shepherd, not as the prophet. We know he was not um, a, a, a prophet by trade, but he speaks a forth telling message um, of God's pending judgment. In other words, he says, if you don't get right, God's going to get you right. Um, in other words, that if you do not repent, God is going to bring about destruction. And if God brings about destruction, Destruction ultimately leads to death. When you sin, um, you ought to receive death. And so I'm going to end it right there and I'm going to give some time back. Good stuff. Dr. Harper, come on, Harper. Come on now. Dot, dot, dot. So uh, thank, thank, you, thank you, my brother, for just going ahead and setting the stage. Uh, we want to continue, obviously, uh, in regards to the state of Israel and the forecoming of God's judgment. So now here is the man of God, the servant of God, who we, who we know was a sheep herder, uh, stated directly by himself later uh, in chapter number seven. Uh, we find here that he brings in three visions. He brings the idea of God's pending doom, God's pending uh, work against the people of God for their uh, uh, state of reluctancy, the state of forgetting uh, who allowed them to gain their prosperity, who allowed them to be where they are. So here we are in the text where God is getting ready to perform a work and he gives the prophet of God three or uh, four consinct visions concerning 
the work that he's getting ready to do. The Bible would tell us in Amos chapter number seven and verse number one, thus hath the Lord God showed unto me. This is what God gave me, says Amos. And behold, he formed grasshoppers, I better locusts in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth. And lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. Listen, family of God, God, God showed the man of God something that you and I need to understand that God had in this vision, we have a first growth and a latter growth. And then there's the king's mowings. What is that preacher? That is when the king would take his stuff off the top. After the king took his stuff off the top, then the people would get their stuff after that. God says, after the king get his, I'm going to bring some, in the vision, God says, I'm going to bring the locusts, and the locusts will consume everything else. What does that leave? That leaves the people of God with nothing. Come here, somebody. I come today to tell you, if you don't appreciate what God has blessed you with, God has show you that where your blessings come from. And after the king gets his, then God takes the second crop, and they would realize that they would be left with nothing. Now, what happens? The prophet sees it, and this is where we get. I need you to see how this works. This is a theme of chapter number seven. What's the theme? The theme is this. There is man's sin, Israel's sin. There is intercession. Ooh, thank you, Lord, for intercession. And then there has chance for repentance of the people of God. I'm glad, I'm glad this morning that there is some intercession, amen, somebody. There is intercessory on behalf of the people because the people were in line with the wrath of God. And if there was not a man, if there was not somebody that came and stood in the place in between Israel and between God, there was pending and sure judgment and destruction. So here, here is the prophet. Watch what the prophet does. The prophet says, Lord, Lord, he begs God. Is He begs God. Watch the prophet of God. He begs God. He says, I beseech you, Lord, forgive. God, please forgive your people. Lord, please forgive their transgressions. Please forgive their mindset. Please forgive their lack of appreciation. Please forgive them in this sin where they've literally become complacent. They, they begin to feel good about it. Not only were they in sin, they were, they were just enjoying themselves in sin. See, it's one thing to be in sin, but it's another thing to lay in that sin and to enjoy that sin. God says it in Amos 6. He said they're laying on the bed of ivory. They're laying in their sin. They're not just in sin, but they're, they're, they are like the pig in the mud. They're just rolling all in it and enjoying it and not realizing that they are in the wrath place of God. So the prophet said, Lord, Remember, and I'm going to pass it with this. Remember that we are small. Oh, Caesar, Lord, we are small. We can't handle what you're about to bring. We can't handle your pain and what you're about to bring to us, Lord. We can't deal with your wrath. Our arms are too short to pox with God. God, please realize our position in your position and please have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Pass the mic. First, I, I just want to step in here. God is working and God is moving. I bring you greetings from the Roswell Church of Christ, Kansas City, Kansas. I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Harris for having me on. Uh, Dr. Crusoe, I want to thank the Roswell Church for being here. And I want to thank the two previous speakers, uh, Dr. Glenn and Brother Harper, for bringing their word. Let me take you back quickly. Let me take you and pre appreciate Brother, Brother uh, Andrew Braxter for his uh Time this morning, and I want to thank you as well. I want to thank you uh, as well, uh, Brother Robin, the, the technical coordinator. Oh, what an awesome job he's doing. But watch this. Amos is a prolific book, and we must do our due diligence to properly understand the text. Can I take you back a minute? Let us illustrate this from the book. Amos is from the Southern tribe. You know that. King Jeroboam II, make sure you get that crystal clear. King Jeroboam II is on the throne in the Northern Kingdom of Israel, and Uzziah is reigning in the south. That'll have significance in a minute. The kingdoms had split earlier under Rehoboam, 
in the south in Jeroboam after the death of Solomon. Now, come here, come here. Let me give you some history right quick. The, the, the northern kingdom was a spiritual mess. As young folks say, they was a hot mess. No direction, no spiritual values, no power of protection from God. They began to worship idol gods. Amos shows up to preach to them, and they did not want to hear the message of God. It was his contemporaries, let me say it this way, his homeboys were Isaiah, Hosea, and Micah. Here is the problem, business is booming. I got money in my pocket. I got stacks and I got racks, but nonetheless, I ain't got God. Come here, somebody. Amos, Amos 8 and 11, behold, the days are coming when I will make a famine in the land. Come here, come here, come here. It's leading up to the 722 captivity. They was going to be taken captive out of Syria in 722 BC. This is about 20 to 30 years before God began to drop the rain on them because he went to idol God because of all the social injustice. And let me get to forgiveness. Can I go and talk about forgiveness? Amos says he sees the vision in verses 1, 2, and 3. Amos sees the vision prevented, presented by God before his eyes. Amos knows the condition of the people. He knows their waywardness. And after seeing the first vision of locusts that were coming to the late crop, as my brother has already explained, this is judgment upon them. Amos sees the judgment of God, and Amos goes to his knees and starts to pray. He says, he says, forgive me up, Crusoe. Mess me up, Glenn. Mess me up. He says, forgive the text, rest says God relented. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't want to get in trouble here. There's a difference between God relenting and God forgiving. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Amos is a sheep herder. Sheep know that people go astray. Amos is a sheep herder. He, he done been and cleaned up messes behind people. Sheep herders sometimes lead from the back. They don't always lead from the front. Watch this, come I know my time is going. But he says God relented. He says, Yahweh relented. They would not turn from their lust and their lasciviousness. They would not turn from their pride and their prejudice. They would not turn from their selfishness in selecting other gods. They would not turn from their waywardness and their wickedness. They would not turn from their oppression and their obstinacy. They would not turn from their rancor and recklessness. This is his prayer for the people of God. And he says, God relented. Now I can get in trouble here because some of them we talk about God forgiving, sometimes God just holds back. He relents. He holds back his anger, and he ain't forgave nothing. Come here. I'm going to get in trouble. Come here. Come here. Watch this. Watch this. I'm in the text. I'll deal with forgiveness. He relents in the Hebrew. God changed his mind. He relented. At this point, it does not say he forgave the northern kingdoms. He relented again in the original language and being true to the narrative. As I look deeper, this is why our topic is, Lord, please forgive Amos is literally begging God to forgive and not destroy the people. It's literally on the prayer and faithfulness of Amos. God shows mercy, gives them a temporary state of execution before they go into captivity, 722 BC. All right, let me help you, but I got 30 seconds. You see, God relents. Have you ever not been able to pay a bill when you was checking in the college at, at wherever you went and, and, and you had to go to the financial aid department and because they went in and, and, and you had to get a forbearance. This is what God does. He deals with them. He forbears them. He shows his compassion towards them. And he does not let the hammer drop on them right here. We'll be back in a minute. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's back to me again. So now, so now, so now we know at this point that sin is running rapid. And because there is sin and no repentance, God is going to bring about uh, or threatening to prepare his wrath. Now, um, it's been noted that God um, from verse number one shares a vision with Amos. And we have two visions here in, in verses one through six. But the first one is that God prepares a great swarm of locusts. I, I want to talk about the locusts uh, for, for just a, a few minutes. And hopefully I have some time to get to this fire. But you have to understand this, that locusts um, are a symbol of God's destroying judgment. Not only that, but watch this. Locusts were known for their ability to bring about devastation 
um, devastating destruction to vegetation. Now, uh, something else you need to know about locusts this morning is that locusts have the ability to multiply rapidly. Um, the female locust um, ovipositor, that is the organ of the insect that's used to deposit eggs, um, that, can, that organ can contain up to 100 eggs each. And they have the ability, watch this y'all, to deposit those eggs into the hardest of soils down to at least four inches deep. Some scholars suggest that, that the, uh, the, putref the putrefaction process um, of the locust, that is the decaying and rotten bodies of the locust can cover a, 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 a length of, of several hundred miles. Not only that, but the stench of the increment, the, the waste that's discharged from their rotten bodies could be smelled for over 150 miles away. So once it is that a plague of locusts were dispatched, it was, invert, it was virtually impossible to maintain, possible, impossible to control, impossible to manage or impossible to stop. Once a locust plague uh, was dispatched and was finished wreaking habit, it left behind nothing but devastation and barrenness. That is the state that God was, uh, uh, was uh, prepared to allow Israel to be in. But notice this, um, as, as my friend of Adrian already stated, that God uh, prepared of this devastation, but but he did it after the main harvest. Lord have mercy. In other words, as he mentioned, the king got his portion first. There was a, a portion that went to the king. The proceeds went to the king. So, so, so God not only sends the locusts um, before the first harvest that went to the king, uh, but before the second harvest. Now notice this. Um, Amos has this vision that, that everything that was planted was devoured and the vegetation was stripped from the land. Uh, because of this devastation, uh, because there was no harvest for them to enjoy, God now says, you once experienced peace and prosperity, but now I'm going to disrupt that. You, you now, you once had peace and prosperity, but now you have pain and no profit. Lord, have mercy. I wish I had some help this morning. Sometimes God will send calamities in our lives before he can get our undivided attention. Somebody ought to say amen this morning. Sometimes God will send devastation in our lives before God gets our attention. Sometimes God will send death in our lives before he gets our undivided attention. Sometimes God will send you a bad report at the doctor's office in order to get your undivided attention. Sometimes God will make you stand in the unemployment line in order to get your undivided attention. Sometimes God says, because you refuse to live for me after I blessed you, because you failed to acknowledge me after I blessed you, you have to understand that whatever I gave to you, I can take it back. And so God says, because you failed to live for me after I bless you, you now find yourself in a state of sin and you are in need of my forgiveness. I'm going to pass it on at this time. Oh, mercy, 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 mercy. Now, now, now we get to, thank y'all brothers. Now we get to the idea of fire. We get to the idea of fire in, in this next vision that God brings to the servant, the man of God, Amos, we see fire. We see a consuming fire. I see, I think, Brother Glenn, my brother, for the passing this thing on here. Uh, fire consumes, Lord have mercy. Fire consumes. Fire uh, destroys. Fire takes everything away. I want you to know that God will bring fire to consume what is not sustainable. Mm. Oh, Lee, oh, Lord, oh, Lord. Let me say that one more time. God will bring fire to consume what is not sustainable. I need you to understand that fire can only destroy things that are not uh, sustainable. I would have you to know if Israel was in a place with God in their faith, their faith might come under fire. But if faith is real, if 
faith is pure, if they were in the right place, then they would be sustainable. But because Israel had got caught up in the stuff, in the things they had. See, the problem with Israel is you can give man stuff, but if his faith is right, the stuff won't have him. I'm going to say that one more time. If a man is in a place where his faith is right, he'll have stuff, but the stuff will never have him. Here, Israel, was their heart wasn't right. They were not in the right place. They didn't love God the way they should have loved God. And because of that, the stuff became their priority. They began to be, get complacent in the stuff. So what does God need to do? God will consume. He will take away everything so you can focus on the main thing. Y'all y'all ain't said it. God will take away everything so we can focus on the main thing. Now the fire in the text could be, of course, the judgment of a power that would come against them in the Assyrian nation. And Amos sees it and he does again what he did before. He stands in the gap. Thank God for the man in the middle. I, I say, thank God for the man in the middle. I believe we've got a man in the middle. I would look at Amos. I would look at Abraham. I would look, remember Abraham with Sodom and Gomorrah. I look at Elijah. I look at all the prophets of God and I see a man in the middle and it reminds me of typology. They, these men are a type of Christ. They are not Christ, but they represent Christ. Here I see Moses in Exodus chapter number 32. He stands in the middle of God and Israel. And, and what does the prophet of God, Moses, say even in his time? God, remember, mm, Lord have mercy. He says, remember, don't look, don't focus on their sin, but remember your promise. Oh, Lord have mercy. Remember your promise. I'm glad that they had somebody in the middle, but we've got somebody in the middle that's greater than Abraham. He's greater than the prophets. He is Jesus the Christ. Paul would tell us in 1 Timothy chapter number five that we have a mediator between man and God, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. I'm glad we've got a man in the middle because if it wasn't for the man in the middle, we would be in trouble today like Israel was in trouble then. We will be in trouble today but thank God for the man in the middle. What does the man in the middle do? He stops God from doing what we deserve, and he gives God a reason to give us what we don't deserve. Y'all ain't see it. I'm gonna say that one more time. The man in the middle stops God from giving us for a moment what we deserve, and then gives him a reason to give us what we don't deserve. But the difference is back then, they couldn't give God a reason, but we've got a man in the middle that gives God a reason because he shed some blood over to thousand years ago he shed some blood that gives God a reason to say one more time one more day and I thank God for his mercy and I'm glad that now even in the midst of everything that we go through that we have a man in the middle and in the sex we see this great power and this great fire we see the consuming nature of our God because I believe somewhere somebody said our God is a consuming fire. He has the power to do it. And we should stand in a place reverently to the awesomeness and the mighty power of God. And Israel, because of their sin, Lord have mercy, sin has a way to make you in a place of deception and unknowing to see that God is who he is and can do what he can do. God bless you, Pastor. Oh, bless the mighty name of the Lord. God is good all the time. Harper and Glenn, y'all done brought a word. Watch this now. Lord, please forgive. Let's deal with this forgiveness aspect. Lord, please forgive. Forgiveness starts in the biblical, in the, in the biblical languages as we look at Exodus 34, 14. Exodus 34, 14, where it comes in here and he deals with this act, this, this idea of forgiveness. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. The Lord, the Lord, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for the thousands, forgiving iniquity and the transgressions of my sins, and by no means clearing the guilty. God relented then. He did not clear the guilty in that case. But watch this. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Forgiveness, forgiveness. First off, first off, I'm going to address this, if I can, with six exegetical premises, six exegetical premises, now and as our close. Forgiveness in the mind of God 
is a deep spiritual proposition. It costs God something. Grace and mercy, mercy costs God his son on the cross. I sin and I continue to sin and I receive his grace. But where grace is, there had to be justice. Jesus made it right. I said he covers my sins. Jesus made it right. My past sins, my present sins, my future sins. I'm trying to get deeper into forgiveness. I hope I, I'm hope, I hope I'm talking to somebody this morning. My topic, Lord, please forgive. The Hebrew, the Hebrew idea of forgiveness in one case means God literally took it away. In another case, he bears it away. Sometimes it is his, it is, it is us bearing our sins. God is bearing our sins. God literally, God literally in a deeper way, he tolerates us. He gives us deferment from punishment. Example, 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 example. The fact that except that scapegoat out, I put my sins on the scapegoat. They did it back in the day. Now, the lamb that was slain for my sins is Jesus. So number two, suggestible premise two, he forgets. I'm so glad that God has sometimes temporary amnesia. As I go deeper with forgiveness, Amos 6 and 7, God relented. You know, the wrath of God was coming, but, but it wasn't going to totally destroy him then because of his loyal love. God has a loyal love. In Hebrew, that term is chesed. They would pronounce it real hard, chesed. It's a chesed. Okay, you don't believe me. Psalms 136, oh, give thanks to the Lord. He is good. And there's mercy, oh, Lord, endures forever. He, he forgets my sins. God, in Jeremiah 31 and 34, God says, I will forgive their sins and no longer remember. I'm glad that somebody else might not have forgot my sin. I'm glad sometimes I don't forget my sins, but I'm so glad that God forgot my sin. And when he forget, oh, come here, somebody. Come here, come here, let me teach you. I'm, I'm glad in this case. God had spiritual amnesia relating to my sins. He could have punished the northern kingdom for being traitors, but he relented. In this case, God chooses to forget. Isaiah, Isaiah 43 and 25, God chose to forget, or better yet, he erases. Oh, I wish I had a chalkboard. God erases my sins. Come here, come here, come here. As I get ready to close, as I get ready to close, as I get ready to close, as I get ready to close. Next, he stomps my sin out. He literally puts my sin under his foot and he stomps it out. So many of us struggling with guilt. So many of us struggling with shame. But God literally puts my sin under his foot because he reigns. When the king put his foot on something, he reigns over it. Come here, come here. Additionally, as we see in Amos, I hope I'm helping somebody. God, in other instances, literally because of his mercy and his goodness, can I teach you on forgiveness and his loyal love? It's the Hebrew word hesed. But watch this. He puts his foot as it relates to forgiveness. God metaphorically takes our sin and tramples it under his foot. He stomps on it. He puts it far away from him. The picture of a king who stomps on something. Stomps. And so he put my sin under his foot. Come here, come here. Consequently, next, he heals. If he's going to forgive me of my sins, he has to heal. God is forgiving my mistakes. He has to heal my brokenness. He heals me. He heals. Psalms 103 and 1 through 4. Bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And don't forget all his benefits, who forgives my iniquity and who heals of all my diseases. Not only when he forgives, he has to heal me because he don't want me doing the same thing. All right. All right. This mic is hot, y'all. I don't know if I can handle it. <laughs> it's hot. <laughs> all right. Let's try to bring the plate in for a landing. We got three minutes to bring it on in. Uh, no doubt, y'all. No doubt. No doubt. No doubt. Israel um, had lost his way um, and had become content with living a life of sin. And, and truth be told, uh, y'all, um, we are not too far from being like that. I wish I had some help this morning. Well, maybe not you, but somebody you know, because, amen, some of us have graduated from sin. But but if you can relate to what it's like 
uh, to be or have lived a life of sin, you should be able to relate to this text. Uh, I stopped by to tell somebody on this morning, it is a dangerous place to be uh, when you have become a decaffeinated Christian with your sins. What do you mean by that, preacher? Well, I'm talking about you become decaffeinated because what you do doesn't keep you up at night. What you do does not bother you. What you do does not cause your conscience to be bothered. You can do it and not be bothered by it. And you you have no desire to change. You have become comfortable with your sins to a place where your sins do not bother. You have to be careful when you become decaffeinated to sin because you need to understand something about sin that we see from Amos. When you sin, you deserve death. When you disobey God, the penalty for that is death. We understand what Paul says in Romans 6, for the wages of sin is death. When you work for sin, you can expect your wages to be death. For the wages of sin, watch this, is death. But Lord have mercy, somebody just missed a good shouting point. I'm so glad for the but. I don't have time to preach about it this morning. But but the but there lets me know that there's an alternative. The reality is that I, when I sin, there should be death. But there's what an alternative, which is life. In Amos, there should have been death, uh, but there we see in the vision that was received, there was an alternative. Amos pleaded for God not to send death. Um, as, as Adrian has mentioned, God stood in, Amos stood in as an intercessor between the people and God, making his case for God to extend mercy. No doubt they were guilty, but God granted mercy at the request of the intercessor. The intercessor is there to intervene on the behalf of someone else. I don't know about you, but I can relate to being a recipient or needing God's wrath, but, 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 because, but because there was an intercessor, Lord have mercy, I, I don't have to deal with the wrath of God because I don't always act right, I don't always talk right, I don't always live right, I don't always do right, but I thank God for an intercessor. Oh mercy, oh mercy. Yeah, 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 yeah. This, this, this getting hot. This thing already hot. We got to get out of here. Okay. Uh, listen, family of God, there is the last vision. The last vision in the book of Amos. The last vision that we have in our text here is that of God showing the prophet of God a plumb line. That plumb line is representative of God's judgment. God said, I'm going to place it in the middle of Israel. I'm going to place it right in the middle of them. What are you saying, God? I, I've relented. I've held back. I've gave them time. Lord have mercy. I gave them space. I gave them opportunity to get it right. But now I'm going to put a plumb line. I'm going to put, I'm going to exact my judgment when it comes to my people. I need you to understand that God, there'll come a time when mercy going to get out the way, when grace is going to be removed and God's judgment shall come to pass. I, it reminds me of a, 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 of a text in the New Testament, in the book of Luke, chapter number 13, as we're looking at repentance, as we're looking at an intercessor, and as we're looking at hopefully a change in the people. I see in Luke chapter 13, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Lord our God, people come to Jesus and begin to bring to him the ideals of what happened to the Galileans, uh, the idea of what happened to them whose blood was mingled with Pilate. I need to understand that they came to some great demise. God looks and turns around and says to them, let me tell you something, unless you repent, ye shall likewise Paris, y'all ain't hearing me. Don't get caught up in everybody else's situation. Don't get caught up in what's happening over there. I tell the people of God this morning, yay, unless we get ourselves together, we shall also likewise perish. But then God speaks a parable. The Bible said in verse 6, he spake also the parable of a certain man that had a tree planted in the vineyard and he came and sought fruit there upon, but he didn't find no fruit. I want you to know we are God's trees. And when God shows up, he's looking for fruit on our tree. But the Bible said there was none in on the tree. And the man said, I'm going to cut the tree down. But then the, the dresser of the vineyard said, hold on. 
wait a minute, give me some time with the tree. Let me ding up, let me ding around it. Let me pull up the rocks that's stopping the tree from bringing fruit. Y'all ain't seeing it. Some of us in the even in the middle of the pandemic have not been fruitful, have, have been still barren. I'm not giving God what he deserves, but I'm glad that God gave us some space in the midst of this time to get it right. Let God work in our lives. Let the Lord Jesus get the rocks that's stopping fruit from growing. Get the weeds that is choking us out and give us some time. And the Lord then said, God, give me some time to deal with it. And if it don't get right when I'm done, then cut it down and that'll be it. Lord, let us get it right before the ax comes and God's mercy. As we close this close the mic session this morning, God is calling us to forgiveness and repentance. I told you he hears us. I told you he, he literally he literally covers us from our sins. But watch this next. He cleanses us. He cleanses us. He cleanses us overwhelmingly to be forgiven by God is to be cleansed by God. That's why David two times in Psalms 51 verses four and verse nine, when he had messed up, he says, wash me and cleanse me from my sins, cleanse me with Tysa. I said, literally, for being washed. Not thank God that we've been washed in the watery grave of baptism. Acts 22, 16, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. But as I close, as I close, as I close, watch this. Okay, back to Amos. Amos begging the Lord for a reckless, wayward, wrongful, willfully sinning generation that forgot about God. Forgiveness is grace granted by God that we do not deserve. It is the thought and notion that God hates sin, but God knows that I have a sinful nature. As Paul says in Romans 7, 15 to 20, oh, wretched man that I am. Paul says, that which I ought not to do, that which I find myself doing, we call those the doo-doo passages. I'm so glad when I make a mess, God cleans it up. I'm so glad that when I make a mess, all I got to do is come from the watch this. Finally, God gave the Northern Kingdom chance after chance after chance to come back and repent from all their evil ways, but they would not do it. He allows them to be put in bondage in 722 BC because of their unrighteousness. Finally, finally, he puts my sins away. I'm so glad that he takes my sins away figuratively and literally he puts my sins behind his back. He picks up my sins and throws it behind his back. He literally picks up my, I was so glad. I wish I had five people. I, I'd make number six. He throws my sins behind his back. It's the literal, that because his mercies are new every morning. Lamentations 323. He puts my sins behind his back because the Lord is always looking forward. Sometimes I'm looking back, but God is looking forward. He literally puts my sins behind his back. Psalms 32 and 1. Blessed is the Lord. Blessed is whose, whose transgression is forgiven and whose sins are covered. But here's my verse as I close. Isaiah 38, 17. But you have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. Close. I close. Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Some men count slackness, his long suffering for just not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. May the Lord bless and keep
Well, I, I think we're woke now. <laughs> I, I, I think we are woke. That Pastor Mike was hot. Man, it was hot. Uh, right on time. D Dr. Glenn, Dr. Harris, Preacher Man Harper, uh, you you guys were on fire. Yeah, man, you were on fire. I, I'm just going to leave it there. <laughs> Y'all was on fire. Thank you. Thank you, my brothers. It, it's a privilege. It's a privilege. You, you started us off, off good. Um, Robin, do you need to come on and give us some instructions? Because we're going to go to the panels now. I, I know everybody has some time constraints. And uh, so I, I'll let you kind of explain what we need to do. I, I think Doss is, is on, and Dr. Carruthers, and Brother Gilbert. Uh, so I think my panelists uh, and Dr. Bird, I don't know if Bird is on, but we'll just give us some uh, instruction of, of how we need to transition. Absolutely. So the way this will happen is we will set a breakout room for the ladies. So the ladies, you'll have a breakout session to yourself. You will actually be able to assign yourself to the breakout room. So what will happen is once we launch it, click by your name or the three dots on your screen. Uh, and you will be see an option to assign yourself to the room. If you don't go to the room, I have, if I see a name and it's a woman's name, I'll move you there. I'll, I'll assist you in moving you to the room. But if your name is a phone number instead of a name, then I'll leave you in the men's session. Now, the men's session will stay in the section, so we will continue to live stream. But the women's session will be recorded. So it will be uploaded to YouTube uh, after the program ends today. So once we go to the breakout sessions, you can assign yourself to your room by clicking by your name in the participants list. There's a little drop down arrow and you can click on that and then you can assign yourself to the women's panel. I hope that is clear. Hope you are able to transition fine. If not, I will be assisting you as uh, as time permits. There will be an hour and a half for the uh, each panel. And two minutes before the panel ends, there will be a countdown clock to let you know, and it will automatically bring everyone back to the main room. I hope that is clear. Uh, back to you, uh, to our, our host, our, our, our moderator. Yes, yeah, back to our moderator. Well, Braxter, uh, any closing remarks uh, for this session? And thank you, sir, for... Uh, stepping in and, uh, and uh, uh, leading this morning session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Crusoe. I appreciate the invitation to uh, to share in this session. I don't know about you, but I've definitely been encouraged uh, today, and I pray that everyone else has been encouraged. I look forward to this panel. Everybody be blessed. All right, thank you, sir. I guess we're ready to to transition, uh, transition, Robin. All right, I see the ladies uh, assigning themselves to their rooms. All right. Looks like I see the ladies transitioning themselves to their room, so uh, that will uh, that's working the way we wanted it to. I will continue to assist the women to move to that panel, so don't don't fret if you're having trouble. I, I got you covered. Uh, so also uh, we will begin our men's session. Joshua, if you would bring up a song while we uh, finish the transition for our ladies at this time. Thank you. 
see who I got on the screen here. All right, Dr. Doss, are you with us? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I'm here. Uh, and we've got uh, Dr. Burt, and I think Dr. Carruthers is on, okay, and Brother Gilbert, everyone is on uh, for the, uh, the men's panel. All right, thank you, brothers, for um, Excuse uh, me, brother. C L N M is Catherine Murphy from Florida. I'm trying to get into the ladies' session, please. Okay. Uh, I'll I'll take care of that now. All right. Good deal. Good deal. Good deal. Thank you. So am I, Brentley Bowie. All righty, we'll, we'll take a so moment. Hi, Mary Scott. Okay, okay. Uh, is there anyone else that needs to be uh, transitioned? Uh, if not, yes, I'm still waiting. <laughs> hey, sister boy. Hey, hey, brother Crusoe. I have enjoyed everything. I'm just, I, I know my name looks like a man's name, but it's a woman's name. <laughs> that, that, that may be what threw them off. All yeah. right. Yeah, but good, good. So tell what boy we said hello. She, right. She's moved over now. Good deal. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Faithful to famine. Uh, Relief and Revival Remedies and uh, Study Out of the Book of Amos. Uh, th this panel uh, of preachers, uh, we want to be practical uh, this morning. We want to help the brotherhood. Uh, we we want to address uh, perhaps some critical issues. And um, uh, as I said, we want to just, just help the brotherhood. Um, this panel is called priests, prophets, preachers, and pastors, what's, what's the problem? Uh, we're gonna address that, but what I, what I thought I would do is start us off by asking each panelist to give us three minutes, a three minutes uh, summary. I'm gonna ask Brother Gilbert, who is the preacher for the Overbrook Park Church of Christ to start off by giving us an overview of the function of priests uh, to help us understand what priests do. Dr. Burt, who preaches for the Glass City Church in Toledo, Ohio, will give us a three minute or less overview of prophets. Uh, and then Bill uh, Doss, from the Liberty City Church in Miami, Florida is gonna give us a three minute or less overview of preachers. 
and then uh, Dr. Carruthers, who preaches for Carver Road Church of Christ in Winston-Salem, will give us an overview of uh, pastors. So because of the brevity of time, or uh, uh, we don't have a lot of time, that's why I said three minutes or, or less. I, I know how difficult that can be preachers. And you know we wanna make sure that we cover the details, but uh, we're, let's have a, a good discussion. Uh, it's not so much a, a, a cross talk or a debate, but we just want each preacher to share from their study and their convictions and we want to help the brotherhood. Um, and, you know, there is a famine and we want to talk about that um, as we go along. So, Brother Gilbert, would you just kind of share with us um, uh, uh, the function of priests? Who were the priests? What did they do? What were they required? Uh, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, good morning. Thank you, Brother Cru Dr. Crusoe. Uh, yeah, the um, I can do less. I don't have to do three minutes. These the the priests, they, of course, they were ordained by God to uh, be the ones to offer uh, sacrifices. Um, all of the priests were taken from the line from the uh, the Cohen family of the tribe of Judah, from, of the tribe of Levi, I'm sorry. Um, and they were appointed on behalf of men to, to they were set apart uh, to represent the people before God. They were to be uh, primary uh, teachers of the law, um, Leviticus chapter 10, verse 11, uh, and that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes of the Lord, uh, that the Lord hath spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. So there, uh, one of their major functions was that of teachers of the law. Uh, for the law shall not perish from the priest, Jeremiah 18, uh, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from uh, the prophet. Uh, and so they, they were set apart, set aside to be teachers of the law, set, set apart, set aside to be the ones who to make the, the uh, specific offerings uh, for the people uh, unto God. And of course, they had other uh, duties uh, such as uh, whether or not a person was was sick or uh, in sin and things of that nature. So they were set up set apart for um, uh, the work of, of course, the temple, the tabernacle, and uh, to be teachers of the word, um, uh, primarily, you know, for God's people. All right, thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Um, and we're going to come back and uh, and and talk a little bit more about about the priests as well. Dr. Burke, good to see you this morning. Um, can you just share with us a little bit of the function, ministry, purpose of prophets um, in scripture? Yeah, well, uh, how I wanna to respond to this is in the context of um, Amos, you know, he, uh, it seems that Amos was not a, a part of the school of prophets. Um, those who are trained, um, I think, um, You've got um, 1 Samuel 19 and um, you got 2 Kings uh, chapter 4, um, um, where Saul had, and Samuel Saul had sent um, some men to arrest David and they encountered the school of uh, the prophets, you know, um, who uh, uh, called the school of prophets. It seems as though there was a group of prophets in the Old Testament uh, that uh, would gather together to to worship, to to pray, and and to be trained to be trained to give a, a the message a prophecy. Um, and so um, the, the other thing, and, and again, I don't I don't I didn't I don't need three minutes to do this. The other thing that I want to mention uh, it, it, when you read the New Testament, you know, you, you find um, that um, there were those who were prophets. Um, um, of, uh, Luke writes, uh, uh, Paul preaches about Joel and those who uh, will have the spirit of God uh, who will prophesy. Um, but, and I think um, one, of my, one of my favorite texts um, is the Ephesians text in Ephesians chapter four, uh, where, where, where um, Paul gives a list of, of those who are gifted by God. And part of that list has to do with the prophets. So um, my, my point is that the, the prophets were designed by God to give a message from God. And it's really clear that some were trained, um, but it's also clear that God can put his spirit in anybody um, uh, to give a message, whether they were a part of some kind of a training institution, um, uh, clearly by um, 
by Amos being a country boy and being able to, to share a word of God. That's what they did. They shared a word of God. And we can talk more about that in terms of questions or what that looks like, but that's that's the bottom line. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. And, 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 you know, what we're trying to do is link the priests with the prophets who did exist at the time of, uh, of Amos. And, uh, and then we'll kind of leap forward to uh, our, our contemporary time. Brother Doss, would you unmute? And, and we thank you. Uh, you, you, you've been like the ram in the bush <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, you know, you said the relief picture, but you, you're more than a relief picture. Um, just give us, you know, if, if you can, uh, the preacher, you know, what, who is the preacher? What does he do? You know, what, what's the charge and, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, good to have you have me this morning, brethren, to be with you. Just delayed Uh, you know, when we look at Amos, first of all, we need to understand that, uh, Amos was, uh, as he says in chapter seven. And the verses 14, you know, I was called by God at a direct revelation. Today, our preachers have a charge. Uh, our direct revelation comes from the word of God and the spirit of God. Uh, not in the way it, that it was with Amos. But we do, as you said, have a charge. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, uh, verses number 1 through uh, 5 is the preamble. Uh, of our charge, and we know it as uh, Paul told them, uh, charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, because he's going to be the ultimate judge. Uh, he's going to judge us uh, when he comes back. So therefore, when we start talking about what a preacher is today and what he does in relationship to Amos, uh, from the Greek word caruso, uh, which means to herald, uh, the preacher was like the heralders in the beginning, when they used this term in the beginning, it was one who spoke for the king. And uh, he heralded for the king, he spoke personally for the king, but his job was to take the message directly from the king to the people. Mm -hmm. Now, the heralder was not to add to it, nor was he to take from it, but he was to take it directly as the king gave it to him authoritatively and with solemn uh, responsibility. Today, our king, we know, is God Almighty. Uh, we take it from the Bible just as he gave it. We herald it with no addition or subtraction. So when we look at this charge over in 1 Timothy, when Paul gave it to Timothy, he charged them, first of all, with urgency. And he said, you know, you need to be ready in season, and you need to be ready out of season. You need to be an all-time ready heralder for God. But then he told him he need to have some practical relevance when you herald this word. You need to understand that you need to be able to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering uh, and doctrine. And uh, he needed to be able to herald that word with relevance and practicality uh, for what it needed to be. Uh, if it needed rebuking, you need to rebuke. When you need to exhort, you need to be able to do all those things. Uh, and then you need to be faithful in what you do and how you herald it you needed to be faithful in what you do. You need to understand that, you need to know that the time is coming, and that time is now, when men would not endure sound doctrine. So you needed to herald it with faithfulness. Uh, our heralding call uh, is one that, and I've often heard this said, and I believe it, that a good preacher comforts the afflicted, and he afflicts, he afflicts the comfort. So All we'll right. talk about that a little later as we go on. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brother Doss. And uh, uh, we, we've got a reminder of our time limit here. Yeah. So, so we know that during the time of Amos, there were priests. Uh, Amos was a prophet. And perhaps in his prophecy, he did some proclaiming and preaching. But there were also pastors that existed uh, during that time. Uh, Dr. Carruthers serves in a unique uh, uh, capacity as preacher and pastors slash shepherd, but give us an overview of pastoring or pastors biblically um, in, in, in the three minute time limit that we have. Got to unmute. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's an amazing thing that um, shepherds, pastors, 
um, the thought of there being shepherds and pastors in the New Testament time uh, is exactly uh, that in that there's so much criticism for pastors in the Old Testament, particularly in passages like Ezekiel 34, 7 through 10, where God says he'll no longer uh, allow for pastors, but he'll send them uh, one pastors. Pastors had a significant role among the children of Israel as uh, men who guided and watched out for, cared for the people of God, gave instruction and leadership, uh, along with others who worked among the uh, children of God, whether they be judges or priests or pastors, uh, I'm sorry, judges or priests or kings or, or even military leaders. In the New Testament, of course, we have that passage um, uh, that uh, details, rather lists, delineates some of the functions that the church was given similar to those functions in the Old Testament, particularly uh, grouped together in Ephesians chapter four and verse number 11, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and, and teachers. And the good thing about uh, this list is that Jesus functions um, to a great degree in all of these uh, roles. When it comes to uh, being a shepherd, he's the good shepherd in John 10 and 11. He's the shepherd and bishop of our souls in 1 Peter 2, 25. He's the great shepherd in Hebrews 13 and 20. He's the lead shepherd in 1 Peter 5 and 4. And so there's enough information about Jesus as a shepherd uh, to uh, share that information with those who would be shepherds today. I'll say this at the beginning, when it comes to the role of the, the shepherd or pastors, I could have said he's the good pastor or he's the great um pastor of the sheep. He's the pastor and bishop. He's the uh, lead pastor. Uh, but uh, when it comes to pastors of the New Testament, we find them operating either as a, a group of men who are also known as, as elders, who are also known as people who oversee. They're also known as people, these pastors are who are senior in age, and they are people who uh, function mainly in a plurality. They function within a plurality, and we'll talk about that uh, more later on, but uh, yeah, it's a gift. Uh, they were a gift both to Israel and these pastors were a gift uh, to the church. Uh, in With this, I grew up in Southern California, which is a state that held the, the greatest number of Mormons outside of the state of Utah. And uh, every summer it was fascinating to me to see the young men who would come around from the Church of uh, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and they had a, had a, had a tag on and that tag read elder. They'd be around 19 and 20 years old. And I would wonder then, is that a good application and use of the term elder? Similarly with pastor today. Well, that, that bell, I, I don't know what that bell sounds like, but it sure does get our attention though. Okay, all right. Thank you gentlemen for, for those opening <laughs> remarks. <laughs> um, well, here, here, here's our, my first question. Um, priests, prophets, preachers, and pastors. What's the problem? Uh, and and I, I ask that with coming from this context. Uh, Amos was a prophet, but he had contemporaries uh, like Isaiah. Uh, there were priests who existed at that time. And there were um, uh, and one priest, Azariah, told him not to prophesy, that kind of thing. But but what's the problem, not then, but now? One, one of the things that I, I find interesting is Amos and Isaiah and others being contemporaries had the same message. You know, speaking for God, they didn't speak a different message, even though they uh, uh, were addressing uh, diff at different nations. Uh, but the message was the same. Uh, what's the problem um, today? Uh, are we on the same page? How can we get on the same page? But but what's the problem? And 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 I'm assuming that there is a problem. And you know there may be an elephant in the room that we sometimes avoid. But but uh, I, I'm I'm going to ask everyone to address that question in three minutes or less. Who 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 would like to go first? <laughs> Uh, 
Well, I ended last time. I'll go first this time with one of the problems that we had with uh, pa pastors in the New Testament was that uh, for, for very many uh, churches, uh, there used to be the idea that no one uh, would qualify to be a pastor. And I mean by that what they uh, also saw as uh, bishops and, and elders. Uh, that was a big problem in getting uh, churches to the point that they would accept the idea that there needed to be uh, pastors in the church. Um, and oftentimes those men would be forbidden to be pastors because they didn't meet in the minds of some the character qualifications that one finds in the first Timothy chapter three, or even the conduct uh, qualification or the having the ability to teach in first Peter uh, chapter, uh, I'm sorry, first Timothy chapter three, or to defend in Titus uh, chapter one. So churches have had to almost suffer without a group of men who are the elders or pastors or or overseers uh, in their in their context. Um, now today, the the problem is not so much that we are not finding pastors. We've just assigned different men to be pastors. And what I mean by that is we're not as much concerned about First Timothy chapter three in calling the name pastor, or nor are we concerned about the, a, most, most, a multitude or multiplicity or a group of people being uh, identified as pastors. Uh, today, we just call certain people pastor in our, in our, in our congregational uh, settings. It, it has no longer become an issue with us. Uh, we just take the verbal form of the idea of feeding and we ascribe that to anybody who feeds and we call that person pastor. Now, of course, my hook to that was my last statement about the Mormons and the use of the term elder. What we demonstrate in our fellowship today is that words no longer have a significance to us by way of definition application from the New Testament as much as what is a modern, a modern use of something among us, a popular use is more important to us than being more exacting on what we're representing or how we're representing the church and, and the function of the church uh, and the uh, structure of the church and the leadership of the church. Thank you, Dr. Carruthers. Um, okay, uh, who else would like to address that? Preachers, uh, well, let me start. Priests, prophets, pa uh, preachers and pastors, what, what's the problem? Are we on the same page? How can we get on the same page? What's yeah. the problem? I'll address it since we uh, started backwards this time. Uh, yeah, I appreciate uh, what Brother Carruthers said, and he was right on point, right on point, because what we need to understand is I feel today, and you, you, you said today, uh, when we look back at the Old Testament, we see that in Amos' day, the men, just as today, took lightly their obligation uh, those priests, those prophets they had back then. And so do men today. I don't think they take the charge as we started out seriously. Uh, I don't think they understand that we have a life or death statement that we make when we get up in the pulpit and when we walk on our daily lives. Uh, we must realize, I think today, a lot of folk don't realize the source, the source of that charge, which is God Almighty. And then the seriousness of the source that Paul gave it to young Timothy. Uh, when he gave it to him, Paul was on death row, and uh, he gave it to Timothy as serious as, as we should take it today. So preaching is a calling, uh, one that we need to understand that it is serious as a, a, a surgeon in the burn unit of a hospital. Every choice that he makes is detrimental or beneficial uh, to the patient, uh, and he must keep his Hippocratic oath. Uh, he's commissioned to do that. Well, preaching is just as serious. Uh, because we have a life or death issue. Therefore, it is as serious as standing before the Supreme Court of the United States. It is more serious because we stand before the Supreme Court of Heaven and we have eternal consequences. Therefore, we are charged uh, to retain a standard. And I don't think that standard sometimes is retained. There's a retention of the standard. Second Timothy 1, uh, 13. Paul said to young Timothy, he says, Timothy, I want you to hold fast the form. That word form is the yeah. word pattern that we use today of sound words, which you've heard of me in the faith, in love, 
in Christ Jesus. And then not only did he say hold to the standard, he says this thing is a, a good treasure. Uh, the next verse, he says, that good thing which you have been committed, uh, keep it, guard it. And we have to guard. And then we have to study. We really have to study. And we take that lightly today. We think it's about us. It's not about us. It's about Jesus Christ. And therefore, Paul said, you know, to the Colossian saints, Colossians 1.25, he says, let me tell you something. I'm a minister, but I'm a minister according to the dispensation God has given unto me to fulfill the word of God. And that word fulfill means tell God's word in entirety. We as men of God, we as preachers are a citadel. A citadel was uh, the heart of the ship, where the armaments was, where the engine was. And so we need to guard as a citadel. And I think that's one of the problems that we have today. Very well stated. And uh, before I go to Dr. Burt and then uh, uh, Brother Gilbert, uh, those who are watching, um, if you have a question, uh, place it in the chat and I'll, I'll try to uh, uh, get to that as well. So Dr. Burt, your, your take on uh, priests, okay. prophets, Past preachers and pastors, what what's the problem? Well, and, and let me let me see if I can make it relevant in, in terms of the what's happening today. Um, let, let me see if I can uh, and having having to think through that. Um, and let me start a New Testament, then I go back. Um, Ephesians four is one of my favorite pas passages on leadership. Um, I think that um, part part of what, what what Paul says to the church there is that um, you you. You you had um, you know you had these these prophets um, uh, as he as he gives you know as he gives the list of prophets apostles um, uh, uh, evangelists and then pastor teachers he, um, he says that um, um, that th those things are a gift to the church um, now um, by by God's grace now that's not grace of salvation y'all you know, that's grace of service so God gives the grace of service so that people can be saved. Um, uh, in Ephesians 4, you, you know, to, to, to build up the body, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and then in the context of our conversation with Amos, Amos is a prophet. As I said earlier, he's not a part of the school of prophets, but he, he's a country boy who God calls to preach and God gives him a message by the spirit. God, God gives him a message by the spirit. Of course, we all cognizant of Joel chapter 2. Um, about God sending his spirit uh, in, uh, in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Um, God sends his spirit in, and he says um, um, there will be prophets. There will be prophets. The spirit will, the spirit will give a message uh, uh, to, the, to the prophets to share uh, with the people. Here, here's, here's, here's maybe a, a present day uh, issue and problem. That message was given to them by the spirit. Well, we, we are all cognizant and we, we all recognize recognize that um, once God gave us the word, the word that we can open it that's written in the word that we can re read, there is no need for you to come and say, um, God has given me a message that goes beyond that which is written. And I think that that may be the challenge sometimes um, with uh, in today's time is that, yeah, I study, um, I do all of the hermeneutics and homiletics and uh, all of the pieces, but but, but let me tell you what God told me last night. And I think we have to be careful about um, saying that God has given, given us a message. Just, just looking for something new, looking for something different, looking for something that's profound, that goes beyond what has been given to us in the word of God. And um, yes, Paul mentions prophets in Ephesians 4, but I think uh, their, their role in terms of giving something beyond, you know, beyond what is written has ceased. Um, and I think we have to be careful about trying to find something new and let's perfect what's, what's old, what's written. All right. Well, well said. And, and, and Brother Gilbert, and then I've got a, a question that came on the chat and then that generated another question. All right. Yes. Well, again, um, I just I look at it from my perspective as a uh, I guess a lifer in the church. Uh, how I uh, you talk about what what the problem is? I think I asked somebody a few years ago, well, "What's all this stuff going on about 
pastor this and, and pastor pastor that. I think a lot of it has to do with with influence and even in, in this culture, who is who is influencing us as as men of God, as people of God. I, I look to uh, Second Timothy, uh, chapter uh, of course, chapter two where uh, verse 14 and following, he says, of these things, put them in remembrance, uh, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words uh, to no profit, uh, but to the subversion of the hearers. He was concerned about, you know, what they were hearing and, and who is influencing who, you know, again, looking at um, where I, you know, come from, you know, uh, that's why I identify originally with with Amos, uh, someone who, again, wasn't of the school of, of, of prophets, you know, um, I, I, you know, seminary, all, all that, but but that came later on on in life. And I preached for 20 some years, you know, with uh, with just the Bible, <laughs> you know, and, you know, uh, you know, of course, you know, bachelor's and, you know, associate, you know, degree from Southwestern and, and whatnot. And, and uh, you know, the Lord blessed the work, um, that I did because I ain't know no better than to preach the word of God, you know? Uh, and so, uh, and so, but I appreciate, of course, the, you know, the, the scholarship and I, I can appreciate uh, because of course I, I'm in it now. And, and, uh, but, but I just think, you know, who is influencing, you know, even, you know, not looking down on, on the younger, you know, preachers or anything like that, but just, again, who is just ask the question, who, who are we being influenced uh, you know, by, you know, uh, Paul was very concerned that, you know, Timothy, you know, again, study the word, uh, you know, um, um, don't give them anything to talk about, just, just preach, pre preach God's word. And, and of course, you know, their, uh, you know, roles for the past pastor, you know, like brother, Dr. Brothers talked about, you know, the pastor, the elder, the shepherd, you know, there, there's roles, you know, for, um, uh, you know, uh, again, the minister, uh, the, the preacher, the evangelist, uh, you know, and just really just who was influencing, you know, I know who I was influenced, you know, by, you know, of course, pioneer, pioneer preachers, but, you know, but again, I, I appreciate, um, you know, a lot of the younger preachers, you know, coming up. It's funny me saying that younger preacher, my goodness, yeah. you know, my birthday's yeah. tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, woo, mercy and grace. Yeah. Uh, your thought, Dr. Cruz, but anyway, hey. uh, but I'm just saying, <laughs> <laughs> who's influencing, who's in, that's the, again, when I look around the landscape, well, who is influencing us? And uh, so, again, from my good, perspective. Good, good word. Good word, Brother Gilbert. And you you happen to be the youngest preacher on the panel today. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so when we talk about younger preachers, today you're the youngest preacher. Oh, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, um, but I went to school with that nigga, so he ain't too far behind. Yeah. Oh, he ain't too far behind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, want to, I want to get to a question that came up to the chat, but I, but I want to ask a question before I get there. And this is just a yes or no. And maybe it won't need any explanation. But when you started preaching, when you started out in ministry, did you start out wanting to be a pastor or a preacher? You know, when, when, when you first started, was your goal, I, I want to be a pastor or I want to be a preacher? J just kind of a yes or no uh, uh, to that. Brother Doss? Hmm. A loaded <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to be a pastoral preacher. <laughs> oh, <Lord. laughs> yeah, yeah. As far as the title is concerned, I wanted to be a preacher. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bro, Bert, <laughs> Dr. Bert. Um, can, can, I, I got a little different, little twist to that, Mike. So give me a little leeway. Um, <laughs> uh, just right quick. Um, I went to Southwestern in 1980. I got there in um, 1980, in August of 1980. I was baptized in March of 1980. Okay, so you can kind of feel me through this one. Um, and um, Dr. Zebedee, uh, Brother Zebedee Moore, he said, man, you need to go to Southwest. And he said, I believe God can use you. So I didn't know what the heck I wanted to be. To tell you the truth, I, I didn't have any idea of um, what, what, I, um, what, what I wanted to be. But there was something in my heart that said, I believe God wants to use me. So when I say that, and I, I don't mean to elongate this, um, Dr. Crusoe, but when I say that, 
I'm saying that I didn't know anything, very little about the Church of Christ. You got, I was, I, I grew up in the Pentecostal Church. Okay, so you see where my my head was. I went out to Southwestern, had never been to Southwestern, had never heard of Jack Evans, um, never heard of James Maxwell, never heard of Terra Texas. Um, didn't know anything about the the Bible and um, and Jefferson Carruthers and Harold Robinson tried to expose that because they walking through and looking at me. You want to be a preacher? Because I had big hair and some dark glasses. Um, they said, you want to be a preacher? But I didn't know anything. So I, I went in search of something that I wasn't even in touch with. Mm -hmm. You know, so, but God is, God showed me that, that he, 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 he wanted me to be a preacher, man. He wanted me to share a word, you know. Now, it's been a journey, but I thank God for it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you, you, you answered it, all right, Brother Gilbert and then Brother Carruthers. Yeah. It, it, I, I think there, there's a saying that goes, you become what you gaze at or something of that nature, you know, and that's why I think it's very important for us to be, um, you know, leaders and men of men of influence. And so I just want to be a preacher. I wanted to be a preacher, you know, because that's what I saw. I saw preachers in my in my church, pioneer preachers, and that's what, yeah, yeah. Dr. Carruthers. Yeah, and I've said before that uh, my experience uh, has been different from a lot of my contemporaries that I attended Southwestern with. Uh, uh, mentioned on uh, the other night that, that they talk about, I'm just a country boy from the country and the a country <laughs> servant. And I told you I'm more than from the country, uh, born and reared on the concrete and the asphalt in uh, Anaheim, California. I lived all my life up until Southwestern in Southern California. I wanted to be a preacher because preachers were heroes in Los Angeles and Orange County. Uh, Arian Hogan was a, was a hero. Even Bacchus was a hero. Uh, English was a hero. They were community leaders. They 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 uh, led churches. They brought churches together. They held the uh, campaign in Los Angeles. They they built up churches. They um, arbitrated problems. Uh, a preacher was what I wanted to be, and I, I was in a congregation with elders, um, uh, of course, in my high school years. But I wanted to be a preacher, and uh, I didn't start preaching. I mean, I didn't start studying to be a preacher when I got to Southwestern. I used to read. Uh, um, novel length religious works in high school of the latest um, theologians and authors of my time. And, uh, and so it's just always wanted to be, be a preacher. And I make a clear distinction between the role of a preacher and the call to be a preacher and the call to be a, uh, a pastor, the appointment of pastor. They are, they are in many ways uh, overlapping, but they are not the same from my uh, um, observation of biblical text and uh, observation of uh, what happened in the New Testament church. All right. Thank you. All right. Here, here's a question that came from someone that's uh, watching the panel. Is there a biblical implication of age and age is in caps when it comes to elders? Uh, so I'm reading it. Let me read it as it was written. Is there a biblical implication of age of elders? So the way I would interpret that, you know, when we talk about an elder, a pastor, a bishop, is there a certain age that that person um, should be at to be considered um, an elder, a bishop, a pastor? One of the, we'll go backwards again, I guess, uh, since Doss and I, we both, we both backwards uh, on that uh, bottom okay. end. Uh, in. The, um, and I want to make a comment about what Bert said too. I think it was quite interesting about being prophetic to say that we have received some new word from the Lord. It's not a practice that we should uh, participate in. Uh, the, the word's been revealed and it's right there for us. I know we, we have a custom of saying the Lord just put this on my heart. Well, maybe he did. Uh, either that or, or, or pork, pork meat or alcohol. Somebody put it on our hearts. Uh, <laughs> but uh, when the man shows up at the door with a badge on and he's 19 years old and it says elder of the, of the LDS, uh, I'm looking at him with a prejudice and I'm saying, how in the world can you be an elder? You're 19 years old. Well, why, why am I judging him that way? Well, I, I, I have gleaned and I may be mistaken that the elder is a man of experience. He is a man of life. 
He is a man of study um, and far accomplished from the man at 19 or 20 years old. Um, he's a man uh, who is perhaps married. He's a man who has children, but not just small children. He has children who can be accused of being riotous or unruly. We're not yeah. talking about the children playing on the pews. We're talking right. about the children in the community that can receive a bad reputation. He's a man who can defend the faith. He's not a child. He's not, he's not a, a neophyte. He's someone who's accomplished in the faith. And so all of that implies to me that he's a man of age. And when Peter writes, Peter writes differently about leadership than Paul. There's a tension between the two because Peter does not even mention the character qualifications in 1 Peter chapter 5. He really is looking at what older men do. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder. He's not saying, I have been ordained to be an elder like you all have in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. What he's saying is, I'm among the aged. And in the Jewish community, aged men were elders, which right. brings nonsense to me to the 19 or 20 year old right. who has ascribed to himself the title elder. It's also makes it difficult for me to understand why the 25 year old is ascribing to himself the, the, the label pastor. All of that seems to suggest to me that what's not serious with us as Bible people is how God has uh, presented the church to us by way of the language that comes to us in our time. It defies what we read when we just simply apply a title because it's convenient in our time, I'm through. All right, yeah. Hey, hey, hey may, I, may I say something? I, I, yeah. I think, um, and Jeff, and, and let, let's stay under that three minute limit too, brother. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah, All right. But, well, that's Jeff's passion right there. That's his passion. Um, but I think Jeff baked the cake. Uh, but yeah. I think, uh, and with everything that he said, the, the church itself, has to be able to identify those characteristics in the person, right. and, I, and I don't know if you if, if you if you're young. I don't even know if the church itself um, uh, can see those kinds of characteristics that was mentioned by Dr. Carruthers in a in a young person, you know. Um, and, and so I think that becomes I think that becomes problematic. That's I think that's why Paul says to Timothy, lay, lay no hand suddenly on any man, yeah. you know. On you know, any person, because again, the church still. I'm, I'm doing a series now on leadership because I want some elders, but I'm I'm teaching the church that you need to be able to identify That's right. particular characteristics in a person who's going to be who's going to be an elder in, at the Glass City Church. Good. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, here's a question, uh, Brother Gilbert or Brother Doss. Did you want to respond? Uh, or yeah, just briefly. Uh, okay. I beg to differ with Brother Bert to say that Brother Carruthers baked the cake. Uh, he iced it and he cut it in pieces for us. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I've seen this by experience, and it's a dreadful experience to see men of God who were not uh, qualified by the biblical standings and by the biblical heritage of having some age on them. That's right. And what detriment it did to the Lord's church. I've seen this personally mm -hmm. and it, it's heartening. It's disheartening. It's hurtful. It's shameful. Uh, and I appreciate the question that came in. Most of all, the person who sent it, uh, uh, there are no dumb questions. They're just uh, misinformed answers. But I appreciate that question so much so because sometimes we uh, don't understand that God has already given us a paradigm. He's already yeah. given us scripture. He's already He's already given us things that we need that are necessary, that are uh, helpful um, for us not getting in trouble. And the qualifications are sound. Uh, the examples of them are sound. And the biblical standards are sound. So uh, a novice has no place uh, in the eldership of the Lord. Plus, you're going to hurt the people you're over. Right. Uh, you're going to injure them. And you're going to injure your preacher, especially. Uh, because you need to be old enough to take care of him yeah, uh, good, good, <laughs> and understand good. what that needs, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Brother Dawes. Brother Gilbert, any, anything yeah, you want to uh, Just, of course, appreciate everything that's been said, and, of course, you can't follow too much behind that. But, of course, from, from a very you know practical standpoint, you know, this life will uh, put you through some things that you really need uh, somebody with wisdom uh, and that comes with age uh, to help you with. 
And so uh, from, a, from a practical standpoint, that's something that is necessary. What that is. Okay. Well, thank you, gentlemen. And I'm going to shift a little bit, but um, one of the things I want to take away from this, Brother Gilbert mentioned earlier about influence. You know, who are we being influenced by or what are we being influenced by? And, and we do know that there's a trend uh, in churches of Christ where preachers are using the term pastor. But I think just this last conversation that we've had um, would, would help us understand the role of the biblical pastor, shepherd, bishop, when it comes to age, and even especially when men who are not of age to qualify as an elder use that term pastor. So I, I appreciate the way that you address that. Um, and what's interesting, which might be a little thing, is that Amos was a shepherd when he was called to be a prophet. <laughs> you know, he he was called from being a shepherd to being a prophet. But let's get back to Amos and something that uh, someone mentioned earlier. Uh, in Amos 7.14, um, you know, it's stated that Amos was not a prophet or a son of a prophet, which indicates that he didn't belong to a professional class, which frequented the uh, so-called school of the prophets, but he was called. Let's discuss the advantages or disadvantages of preachers and leaders receiving training. So, so Amos was not from a school of the prophets, but he was a prophet. Um, what are the advantages or disadvantages of training? And there's different types of training. So, uh, Brother Doss, would you kick us off with that? You know, would you start us off with that? Uh, unmute, sir. There you go. All right. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. When we start out talking about training and education, you know, you know, I think formal education is very beneficial, uh, not only to enhance and enrich uh, who we are and what we're doing, but it enhances and it enriches the preacher uh, to be a student of the word of God in a better way uh, to give him a greater arsenal uh, in this world of competing paradigms and schools of thought and doctrinal challenges that we're gonna run into. You know, uh, we need to study, uh, you know, 2 Timothy 2.15, of course. But uh, Hosea 4.6 says, if my people, my people are destroyed because they lack knowledge and because they reject knowledge. And uh, he says, because of that, I'm gonna reject you or you're not gonna be my priest because you don't have a desire to know me, is really what he's saying, uh, and to know the law that I've given. Uh, Solomon said in the long ago, Proverbs 1 in the verses 5, Solomon said, now a wise man uh, will hear and will increase his learning. Uh, and a man of that caliber, he goes on to say, will be a man of understanding and shall attain uh, wise counsel, uh, Proverbs 1, 5. So does that say that if you're not educated formally that you can't teach? No, that doesn't say that because history tells us that those men who had wisdom, such as uh, Abraham Lincoln. When Abraham Lincoln was elected to uh, put up to be the president, uh, they asked him to fill out a form, and the form on it had, what, what kind of education have you had? And uh, Abe Lincoln said defective. He just wrote the word defective. And he was embarrassed about his education, but he had a lot of wisdom, as Brother uh, Gilbert has said. Uh, Thomas Edison was self-taught. Uh, Einstein was self-taught. Henry Ford was self-taught. So that does not say that we have to have the formal education or we're not gonna be able to preach or teach, but it does uh, let us know, even Ben Franklin himself said, now one of the best investments uh, that you can give, that your money can buy, is to pour your purse in your head. Mm. <laughs> That's what Ben Franklin said. And he was self-educated. And so he understood that the formal training, the formal education, is one of the best investments that you can. Uh, secondly, your congregation will not reach its full potential. Uh, if the preacher, I feel, this is my own feel, my own belief, uh, and the leadership are not trained and not educated, uh, it enriches you as a man of God in your closer walk with God to know what you're talking about and know uh, the syntax of the verb, know the context, know how to apply it, and then know how to give it 
in a legible, understandable way. Uh, you have so many, some folk have so many degrees till uh, they become like Festus who said Paul uh, had become mad. But education is, uh, I feel, training is, is detrimental, is needed. Dr. Bird, what, what's your take on it? The, the advantages or disadvantage of, of preachers, preachers and leaders being, being trained? Well, I, I think um, the, the disadvantage is that don't 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 believe everything you studied somewhere. I don't care where you studied it. I think you 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 know, um, I I I've, I've sat in classrooms. I, I have a doctor's degree, and but I don't believe everything I, I've I've uh, been taught in these schools of of, of of these seminaries and things of that nature. I think that's a disadvantage that kind of like it's like I found something new, um, uh, that make makes what I've been preaching wrong. You know, I think we have to be careful about that. That's a disadvantage. I think the advantage is. And I said this, like I said, I'm in a series on, on leadership because I think we got some people that can be elders. I think I've been in glass city 23 years. And I've said, I just said last Sunday, I said, if there's there's certain things that the preacher needs to teach the, the church, you know, for example, you know, hermeneutics. I taught hermeneutics five times in the 23 years I've been there because I, and so I said, um, I said that if there are people among us who want to be elders, they they need to know hermeneutics, how to, they, they don't, you don't have to go to school to do that. I don't know how to do it. My job is to teach you how to do it. And if you don't know how to do it, then you've been, you've been slacking, you know, you don't, you don't make a person uh, an elder in a church so, so they can start studying. You make one an elder because they have been studying. They've been at the, at the, at, uh, burning the midnight oil. And I, it was my, it has been my responsibility to teach them to do that. Here, here is, here is, um, hermeneutics. Here is how you put a lesson together because you need to teach here, here, um, um, here, here, here's, um, how you, 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 you know, you shape the doctrine and stay within the context of, of the, of the, of the teaching of the Bible. So, and it means that you spend some time studying, um, the word of God, it, 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 you know, um, it, I, I taught them about translations. We got different kinds of translations and I taught them about manuscripts. I taught them all that kind of stuff. And I said, if you don't know, that means you haven't studied. You, you haven't gone and study. So you, you ought not be an elder. So I can, my job is to pour into that church. Mm -hmm. It's to pour into that church and make sure the church have some men that are equipped to do the work of ministry. That, that, that's that's my job, and I think that's the positive side of it. And if and if you and the guys that if, if we're blessing God, the guys that we God bless to ordain as elders are men who grab all of that. They grabbed it and they took it and they ran with it. I didn't I didn't have to walk with them every day. They took it and they ran with it. And I think that's what's um, the advantage to me. All right, very good, uh, Brother Gilbert, and then Brother Doctor Carruthers. Just uh, real quick, I appreciate. Uh, what has been said thus far, um, you know, trained, trained, trained by who? <laughs> I guess that's the question. Trained by, uh, trained by who? Uh, I, I remember when I first went to, uh, you know, seminary, one of my first, you know, uh, classes and the professor, you know, said that, you know, uh, you have to know who you are, whatever, what religion you are, you have to know who you are, what's, what's at your core, who you are because you may hear some things and experience some things that, uh, you know, might, you may have some, some, some problems with. And so your faith shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't, you shouldn't experience the domino effect or something like that. He said and this, you know, because there are some things that you may hear or may not understand. And so you have to know who you are. Uh, if you go again, one of the advantages of going to school, you know, um, it, it helps, it, it helped me just kind of know who I, who I am, even though I was in classes with, with non-Church of Christ, you know, members, it still uh, helped me, uh, you know, solidify who I was, who I am at, at my core, you know, um, as a, a member of the body of Christ, uh, of the Church of Christ. And so um, uh, the, the advantage, again, the advantage of, of course, higher, higher education, uh, of course, you know, you uh, helps you to uh, appreciate, you know, um, a lot of the, you know, scholastic, you know, uh, scholarly readings, uh, you know, Bonhoeffer, Tillich, you know, all those guys, you know, just, you know, dead Europeans, you know, um, um, <laughs> and it helps you, you know, think, think through some things. But I guess what I'm saying is you have to know who you are at your core, you know, uh, you know, it's like, you know, picking through a meal, you know, you take it, you throw the bone away, you know, you take what you, what you can get. And, uh, and that's why for me, you know, I went to school again late, later, you know, I was 50 
when I, you know, took my first, you know, quote unquote seminary class. And so um, uh, I don't know if I would would still be the same if I had done it 20 years prior. I, I don't know. I can't say that, but I was just kind of settled. So again, uh, you have to know who you are, um, uh, you know, their advantages and of course their disadvantages. Uh, again, like has been said, you know, doesn't mean that you're less of a preacher, you know, because I think I've experienced both both sides of that. And the Lord is blessed uh, either way, either side. So that's my two cents. Doctor, thank you, Brother Gilbert and Dr. Carruthers. And, and, and I do have a follow-up to ask you guys on this. Church men should uh, work to fulfill what Paul advised Timothy to do, 2 Timothy 2 and 2, the things you heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Teaching ought to be an ongoing process in the uh church from generation to generation and those of us who teach need to make it our responsibility to teach the next the uh, next generation i've demonstrated uh, in my doctoral studies uh that the first seminary uh, in the uh church was headed by uh paul paul functioned as a gamaliel to the uh, first century church uh his students are are listed throughout the uh, new testament one place acts 20 and verse 4 um, Acts 20 and 4, they accompanied Paul into Asia, Sopater of Berea, the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, Gaius of Derby, and Timothy of Asia, Tychicus and Trophimus, uh, throughout each province that Paul traveled, whether it was Galatia on the first missionary journey, Macedonia and Gaia on the second, and then he was in Asia on the third. Out of each one of those provinces, Paul would pull a man uh, out of those provinces, and he would edu uh, educate that man to be an evangelist in the local churches and he would send them back and forth. I've been in uh, church arbitrations where, where elders or leading brothers will be saying, well, you know, you only had Timothy and Titus um, as evangelists in the first century. They had abilities and gifts that other evangelists don't have. And I know immediately that's an untaught church because Timothy and Titus, of course, were not the only evangelists. And there were many evangelists who did much more than Timothy and Titus. For example, Luke wrote his own book of the Bible. That's the gospel of Luke. Luke was an evangelist, Mark was an evangelist. He wrote a gospel uh, of the book. No, they did not have uh, the same uh, uh, ability or do the same things. And some of them had more authority than even Timothy and Titus. And Timothy and Titus didn't even write their own book. But we find Epaphroditus, we find Epaphras, we find Aristarchus, we find all of these men that Paul had trained in the first century going in and out of these churches, training these churches, training elderships, visiting again, retraining elderships, retraining churches. And it's a complete line of thought that oftentimes we didn't cover in 20th century Christian or gospel advocate or in our educational material in our churches. And so our churches don't know that our, our, our institutions, our, our churches ought to be educational institutions in the word of God. We ought to lead in educating theologians and preachers and church workers. And, uh, and as uh, both Brother Gilbert and uh, Brother Bird have said, and, and Doss to an extent uh, as well, you have to know your foundation. You, know, you need to know uh, what you believe. And the good thing about scholarship in my particular field of scholarship, it doesn't matter whether I'm sitting with a Presbyterian or Methodist or Baptist or Calvinist or process theologian. Whenever we sit down, we don't disagree on the fundamentals of scripture. Right. You aren't, you're not a scholar. If you do right. that, the denominational boundaries are not there when it comes to what the, what the text really says. The boundaries come in the traditions, not in what the text says. And our right. responsibility in the church is to teach the text. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh... I, I think we're getting warmed up here. <laughs> All right, that, that's a good, good response. Well, one of the things that I should have made the question a little more clearer, there, there is informal training. You don't have to go to school to be trained. Right. Many of us, uh, some of us came up under gospel preachers. Yeah. Gospel preachers yeah. trained us, yeah. you know, and some of the best training that I can remember came Sunday after Sunday worship, when the preacher would take me and another young man out, we'd go to lunch, we'd go to visit the sick and that kind of thing. And we'd sit over the table and he would talk about ministry. You know, another preacher had classes for ministers. You know, one of the concerns, and I didn't really insert this, but one of the concerns is, is sometimes in churches of Christ, if you're a good speaker, you can be a preacher. Yes. You know, you, you, you don't have to know the Bible, you, mm -hmm. but you can just be a good orator and, and, and someone will make you a preacher. And, and, and well, that's another subject. But let me ask this. Uh, <laughs> that, that's another thing. And I'm the moderator. I, I can't insert my, my feelings. But but I do want to get this in some. 
and I underlined some, after receiving training at Christian colleges, and I got Christian in quotes, uh, Christian colleges, seminaries, and schools of preaching have left the faith. What can be done to curb this disturbing trend? So I've heard, I heard from some of you talk about going into schools with a foundation. And, uh, you know, I've got a Baptist background, Presbyterian background, a Lutheran background, and Church Christ background. Uh, but we, we are aware that some have gone to school and then they leave the faith. So what can we do or what can be done to curb this disturbing trend? Uh, who wants to start off? I'll start. I'll yeah. start. I, and, and I'll say this and, and I'll be quick about it. I don't know of anybody who's left the faith who has discovered something different and new in teaching. Uh, one doesn't leave the faith and go to the Baptist faith because he now understands that baptism is no longer taught in the scripture or necessary or effective in salvation. He does that solely because he wants to be in another religious environment. Right. And that's the same with others I've known who've left the faith, but which is not the challenge. The challenge is for those of us who are in the faith to have the courage enough uh, to say to our brothers and our sisters, who say they have left because of new knowledge to sit down with them and have them share that new knowledge if it is for real. I have not found it for real in anybody uh, who has left the faith. And then for some of us, there's no really no idea of living the, leaving the faith. For many people, just saying that you're a Christian today and in a Christian fellowship is enough for many of us. And we applaud and we stand in ovation and we thumbs up and we, we like on Facebook folk doing a whole lot of things that are not biblical because we lack the courage to speak in love to our brothers and our sisters about what maintaining faith is about. So, I, and I've talked to some of these guys who say they left the faith because of what happened in the church of Christ. And, and, and I'm trying to be nice on this program right now. What's this, this school of religious study? I'm not, I'm not even saying what I want to say. If I say what I want to say, then somebody's feelings going to be hurt. That's not the thing about it. But no, if we just lovingly have a conversation with one another about what the scripture says, what a person says about leaving the faith because he got some new knowledge in some seminary, it will be found to be a lie. And no new knowledge and no seminary making you leave, leave the church of Christ. You're leaving because you've got some other stuff going on. And it's the right. same for the Methodist who right. leaves, the Baptist who leaves, because they're doing the same thing. They're exactly. doing the exact same thing our folk are doing. They're, they're searching, they're exploring, and they're ending up in different places. But it's not because there's new biblical knowledge, just, just not new biblical knowledge anywhere. Hey, let, let me let me come in behind Jeff because I think and I, I appreciate what he the passion and which he's talking about. He mentioned love. Um, and I think that's important. Um I, I think that and, and and I'm not gonna call some names in terms of what in the years that I've been in the Church of Christ that I've seen men, preachers literally destroyed, you know, um, for take for saying this or that or doing this and that. And many of us are cognizant of those people. But I think Jeff mentioned love. I think. I think we have to create an environment of love and trust. Those are two different things. Love is, is what I give and I can love everybody, but trust is what I earn. And I think if we created an environment where people had the freedom uh, and, and, and know that they're going to be loved, see, I can love you and not necessarily agree with everything you say. So if we could create an environment where, where, where you know, um, People are not getting beat up because they, they have some challenges to see some things differently. That if we had, if we could just create an environment where we can have those kind of conversations and sit at the table in, in different contexts and work through um, right. th those particular challenges that some people have, maybe the outcome could be better. Maybe not, but maybe it can be better. But I think sometimes... Um, I remember when I was in my doctorate program, I grew up with a dog outside the house, not inside the house. My wife said she wanted a dog inside the house because I was back in this office all the time and she needed some kind of friend. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so she, she got a dog oh, and, and, the first, and, and this is the first dog. She got the little dog, right. dog been like my grandkids. So you got to go. If you don't like my right. grandkids, you got to go. Then she said, well, I'm going to find me a dog. She got a second dog that didn't like me. I know you got to go. If you don't like, you growling at me when I walk in my house. 
you know, um, you, you've got to go. And But then she found a third dog that we have right now. And the dog loves everybody. And everybody loves the dog. That doesn't mean that um, we always agreed with what the dog would do. That dog was well trained, not by me, but by my wife. And that dog, that dog knows when you get up and they see you, she, that dog, she see you putting clothes on in the morning. Guess where she goes? She goes, she walks to her cage. You, you, do you understand what I'm saying? So what my point is, and this is just what I believe, if we create an environment where there is love and trustworthiness, I tr you know, um, then we can sit down at the table and we can talk through these things. We can hash out these things. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody who, who wants to walk away not going to walk away, but that does mean we can have those conversations of true fellowship, you know, where we're yeah. talking and we're communicating. and Because sometimes... I just need somebody to say, no, you're not looking at that right because here's what that means, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it gives me something to think about. That's my take on it. Well, well let, let me ask this because Dr. Bird, I, I sure appreciate what you said and, and Dr. Carruthers, but you're touching on something that's real critical and crucial. So how do we create that environment? Because what, what I hear is when, um, now, you know, I see things on Facebook and I, I don't, the, the things that I disagree with or things that I haven't been taught, I, I try not to publicly address those, but, but I'll, 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 I'll inbox a guy. I, I'll call a guy, mm -hmm. but then the response that you get right. is why are you bothering me? <laughs> why are you getting in my business? Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so how, how do we, uh, uh, you know, and I, I didn't get the brother Dawson, brother Gilbert. So maybe I'll, I'll address, uh, ask them and then come back around. So how do we create that environment to work through uh, some passages or uh, traditions that we disagree on? You know, I, I, I think that's that's been our issue for many, many years. Just, uh, you know, um, generational gap. I don't know what we want to call it. Younger preachers, older preachers, um, just trying to find that trying to find that medium. You know, of course, we are. Am I my brother's keeper? You know, um, can I can I approach like you do, brother so and so online and say, hey, doc, what about this passage without, you know, being, you know, pushed aside and, you know, saying, well, leave me alone. Let me do my thing. You know, uh, and, and yeah, that, that's I don't know if I have the answer to that. I just think um, we have to look at, you know, trying to bridge this gap, you know, some kind of way and making it OK to like Dr. Bird said, you know, we may not agree on this, 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 this point or this or this text, but you're still, you are still my brother, mm -hmm. you know? And so somewhere along the line, because I disagree with you, I'm not your brother, or I don't, you know, um, I don't somehow you know, see your value as a person or as a, as a, as a gospel preacher, you know, um, you can't tell me, you know, again, Jesus had his, his 12 disciples and they didn't all agree you know, but they wanted to be with Jesus. And so they put some things aside. And so do we want to be with Jesus? You know, that's, that may be a, you know, a question of what are we going to do to um, make sure that, you know, we stay with, stay with Jesus, stay with the Lord um, and just kind of work through those things, have the courage, even I think somebody said that have the courage, like brothers have, have the courage to, um, to, to say something, um, because, you know, again, none of us is getting any younger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, all right, Dr. Doss, Doss, anything? And then then we go to Bill Carruthers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to piggyback on what has already been said. I want to appreciate these brothers who have said, uh, uh, Brother Carruthers, and also the love, Brother Bert, and uh, our responsibility, uh, Brother Gilbert, our responsibility. Uh, what we have to understand is, first of all, and I believe you asked this concerning, and uh, when you leave the faith, uh, we can fall. James lets us know we can err. <laughs> and uh, I believe you're asking uh, as far as apostasy. Uh, John said in First John 2 long ago, he said, you know what, my little children, I'm writing to you that you sin not. Uh, but if you sin, what I want you to know is you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who's in situation for our sins. What he was talking about over there is that some will fall. There's a possibility of falling. There's a possibility and probability of falling by the wayside. But he says in a little while further down that, that my little children, you have to understand that 
that you've heard the Antichrist is coming, time is now is. And then he says, they, there are some who went out from us and they were not of us. And if they had been of us, they probably would have continued with us, but they went out from us that they may be manifest, that they were not, not all of us. And he says, but you have an unction, you have the spirit from God and you know these things. And because you know the truth, then you have to stick with the truth. So some folk will fall, that young people will fall and we can't get them all. Some older brethren have fallen, have uh, fallen from the faith and from the doctrines of Christ. Uh, and so therefore what we have to do is, and brethren, this is the way I see it. And I'm not an expert in this area. I've had to deal with this area for a lot of men who have fallen. We, to make them, how do we curve it? We have to paint a better picture of the ministry as ministers of the gospel as poor pity evangelists and men of God. Uh, we have to water the grass of our evangelism on this side to make it look attractive to, to those who hopefully will see a better picture. Because many times the preacher has self-inflicted wounds. They have destroyed their own integrity, their own character, their own morality. And sometimes that is a turnoff to a lot of individuals. Uh, far too long, we heralded the pitfalls of the ministry. Let's talk about what's good about the ministry. Let's talk about what good God is doing in the ministry for us. And like a marriage, uh, preachers, when they go to a congregation, it's like a marriage, it's like congregation. Uh, you have a relationship with that congregation, but you have to not go into it with uh, uh, destructive and, and, and unrealistic expectations. Know right. what you're getting into when you're getting into the ministry. And you need older preachers to teach you that and tell you that. And it's our obligation. Then, too, if some fall from the ministry and we know it personally, it's our obligation to go to them. It's our obligation to pick them up. It's our obligation to hold them up. And it's our obligation to build them up. Galatians 6. Number one. I, I just I just wonder when Brother Dawes talked about older preachers, everybody looked at me, you know. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> why why, why y'all look this way at the old preacher? You know, I, I guess for once I get to be the oldest preacher on the panel. You know, I don't sure. know. <laughs> yeah, I, I was thinking while Doctor while Doss was uh, talking, I said he's talking like an older man. But what yeah. he's saying, and, and of course Bert and uh, Gilbert as well. Here's here's some realities about ministry. Paul said it: some will fall away. Yeah. All right. We ought to restore in the spirit of meekness and love. We, yeah. we should not try to become enemies. Uh, we should admonish each other as yeah. brothers. But we cannot, every time someone falls away, right. point at ourselves as no. uh, the reason they fell away. Right. Sometimes they fall away because yeah. they are caught up in the yeah. snare of the That's devil. Right. Sometimes right. they fall away because their, their biblical That's knowledge right. is, not, is not correct. Or they may be too much into people's opinion about right. themselves to maintain. And a person should be taught what he's doing when he comes to the faith. And uh, the reason you need older preachers around is because you need to know, you need someone to know the stages of teeth. I yeah. often use this illustration. The three-year-old child looks at her mother who's about to have the baby and is excited. And the baby brother is born. And the three-year-old looks and she says, Susie looks at uh, uh, Timmy and says, Mommy. Timmy has no teeth. Timmy has no teeth. Well, mom is not excited. She knows Timmy was not to be born with teeth. And so Timmy uh, grows and now his older sister is, is six and, and he's three and he's got teeth. But now she's nine or rather she's six and she's lost her teeth. And she's saying to her mama, I've lost my teeth. And, and, she's, saying, and she's saying to mama, all I want for Christmas for my, are my two front teeth. Well, mommy's not excited. She knows you lose your teeth at the age of six, but now she's 23. And she says, mama, what happened to daddy's teeth? Well, mama's not excited. She knows the teeth are in the bedroom on, in the jar. She <laughs> understands the stages of teeth. What's happened in our brotherhood is we don't have people who understand baby I teeth, uh, incoming Simple. teeth and jar oh, teeth. Please. And when you cut off please the please. generations mm. and you have the three-year-olds trying to figure it out and the mm. six-year-olds trying to figure it out and the 21-year-olds mm. trying to figure it out and they won't hear anybody, then thus you have a brotherhood of people with folk under 30 who think they know it all, folk at 50 who think they've experienced it all, and folk <laughs> over 70 who don't want to help anybody. <laughs> and as a result, the brotherhood suffers. Now, now let's get back to being biblical. Let's expect what the Bible expects 
love one another, be gentle with one another, try to understand one another. And I'll say something right. about education. Education does not make a man haughty. Education makes a man walk in humility. That's what mm -hmm. a real educated man will demonstrate right. in his life. Amen. Okay, well, let, me, let me say this. And, yeah, uh, go ahead. <laughs> I'm telling y'all, this is me now. So I'm not asking y'all to embrace what, what, what I say. This, this is me. I, I think number one, maybe we need to make a shift as a brotherhood into more. Um, Dr. Okay. Crystal said that uh, 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 in terms of preaching, if you, you know, if you can hoop, you know, if you're gifted, you're a pre I, and and if you can sing like like Dawson and, and Gilbert, you know, you, you can be a preacher too, you know. Yeah. Uh, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Watch you out now. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but maybe part of the conversation needs to be, you know, like as we pray God will get grace us enough to build up our national context uh, in the Christ that we shift from more of a, a preaching, a primary right. preaching right. kind of a paradigm to a more uh, uh, educational kind of paradigm where, right. where we can kind of sit at the table. Maybe we can make that kind of cultural shift uh, by 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 the grace of God, where we as as a as a, yes. a, a, a nation of people who are um, uh, in the Church of Christ have these kind of real deep seated conversations that is with love, that yeah. with love and 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 with yes. um, tr yes. trustworthiness. That that's the that's that's one of the things that I I think we could do. And I think secondly, and I mean no harm when I say this, y'all, but I'm you know. When I got in the, became a member of the Church of Christ, I didn't know about it, but I know about it and I've been around, I've been observing, I, I watched it. it all, and it is that maybe we ought to cover um, the fact that people are struggling doctrinally, yes. like we cover morality. Yeah. Immorality. Come on. Uh, uh -oh. in, 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 Did you yeah, we, oh, we cover immorality very well in churches of Christ mm. to the point that we let people extend their immorality so far so far they they get lost and come and, on and, and try, we, maybe we ought to cover it like that well Again, <laughs> that, 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 and that's just me speaking you know I, now don't get we all got something wrong with us we you know again we like donuts we got holes in us but what i'm saying i know that we we are a, a, a brother could call us man and 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 um his life doesn't caught up with him, and we'll cover it. Ooh, we'll cover it. Let's let's cover this brother. That's my brother. Let's cover this brother. Uh, you know, and I think, and and I, and when I mean by covering, I don't mean we accept it, but we protect our brother. Protect him, yeah. And mm -hmm. then we help our brother walk through those those fleshly struggles and battles that exist with them. And maybe maybe again, that's that context for me and our brotherhood that created a culture to say, uh, we love you. Uh, and you can trust us, and we're gonna walk trust through it. Now, I agree with everybody who says you can't help everybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody, everybody can't help, be helped. I yep. love my brother, but I could never help him make a change. And because of the things he did, I don't get a car with him in a car with him until this day. Do you hear me? Yeah. If I'm going somewhere with you, I'll meet you there, brother. I ain't riding with you because I don't know what's going. Yeah. Well, that's a good word, uh, Doctor Bird, and, and I and I. And I'm praying that we can follow up on that. And, and I, I'm really praying and I'm really trying not to say too much, but I'm, <laughs> I'm praying that we make a practical, you know, we just don't talk about this, but we actually uh, do something about it. And, and I, and I want to say, if we would take that approach, there would be less firing of preachers. You know, if we tried to cover a guy and, and help a guy, you know, mm -hmm. uh, preachers wouldn't have to move around so much. And, you know, uh, if we would cover him and try to help him. So you know, we, we got to get there, brothers. Um, and man, man, I mean, I really want to say a whole lot, but time don't. don't uh, let me get to this time. Time just thank you, Dr. Burke, Dr. Carruthers, uh, uh, Brother Dawson, Brother Gilbert. Here's one one question. I think this is going to take us out. I'll, I'll check the chat and see if there are other questions as well. Back to Amos in chapters three through six. You, you hear a series of hear the word of the Lord. All right. So Amos says this is what the Lord is saying. Uh, now, in our present culture. What are the major challenges or trends facing the church? And what what's the word of the Lord to those trends and challenges now? So Amos was a prophet. Uh, God put on his heart what to say. We have scripture now. So we ain't looking for God to speak to us in the middle of the night. Tell us what to say. We're going to go to the book. Uh, so what is the Lord saying 
through preachers <laughs> concerning the major challenges and cultures that the church is facing today. Dr. Doss, start us off. Yeah, I'm going to start off because they didn't let me comment after Bert and uh, Carruthers, but, uh, and now we all got holes. But, uh, <laughs> got holes. But I, I ain't got no hole. I'm like an apple fritter. I got bumps and, and hard places. But anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, I think, I think Bert and uh, Carruthers, we started something this morning. And to add to what Bert said before I go into that line, and I'm, I'm going to be in my time, uh, we need to be to put another word more therapeutic because mm. we all have some, mm. uh, some some sick spots in us and we all have some tough places and we need to be more therapeutic and and that's all i'm gonna say but anyway <laughs> some of the things made the challenges that are going on today uh our churches we're in the midst of covid that's one of the major challenges that i see that are affecting us and as brother uh, Carruthers said the other night it brought out a lot of who we really are. It showed who we really are. It's a major challenge we're facing today. And what we have to understand is if we're not running uh, virtually or, or electronically, we found out that we won't even hardly have a church uh, because we have to mask up. We have to, and that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Another one of the major challenges, and we'll, that I could stay all, all day on that, but how it affects us spiritually socially, psychologically, emotionally. Uh, and then uh, it's static. Uh, the viral media that today is a major challenge today because we got media preachers uh, who are viral. Now get, get what you get off of the airways. But everything as Brother Bert has said that you read is not sound. Everything that you read is not sure. It's not something uh, that is inspired from the word of God. So the media is one of our, our kids today have something in their hand uh, and it's not the Bible, it's, it's their phone and their, their tablet. And that is a major challenge if we have to be realistic about it. And we must, we must address uh, that major challenge. And then also don't have a whole lot of time, but uh, we must love. Our love has, as the Bible puts it, has waxed cold. And Brother Burt talked about this, Brother. Uh, uh, Carruthers touched this. Our love has waxed cold. We we don't love like we we ought to love. Agapio. Uh, we in certain schools, certain cliques. We we listen to certain folk. We don't listen to other folk. And uh, y'all, are you in this school, Doc? You in that school? Mm. Our love has waxed cold, brethren. And uh, we've got to love everybody and show that love. And uh, and uh, so those are some of the major challenges. And our challenges is doctrinal. It's not always what is doctrinal. And that's our problem today, many times in the church among us uh, and its styles and all that we like and what we don't like. And those are some of the major challenges. Thank, thank you, Dr. Dawson. And, and we got about eight minutes now. So let's, let's try to get everybody in in these last eight minutes. Brother Gilbert and then Brother Burton and Brother Carruthers. Well, I think, of course, in dealing coming through this, uh, you know, COVID uh, environment, and it has it has ripped the uh, the covers off a lot. Uh, one of the things just, uh, you know, from personal experience, you know, dealing with the area of, of mental illness um, in our in our in our congregations, in our churches, in our families, you know, um, making it all right to, uh, you know, to seek help, to seek counseling, to seek, you know, therapy you know, those kind of things uh, are, you know, where we, we, we like to think we're Superman, you know, but certainly we, we are not, and we, we go through things and we're seeing this in our, in our people, in our congregations, in our, in our families. And so just real quick, just again, that, that is a challenge that, uh, that, that I face, you know, of course, per personally. And, um, and, and I think that is something that we can begin and ought to begin to, to address if we have not already. So that's, that's a small one. It's really a big yes, one. Sir. All right, thank you. Dr. Burt? Yeah, uh, Paul says, for the preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness, but unto us who are saved, uh, it is the power of God. Here's the problem. Here's, here's, one, here's a, a problem. It's, and, and, and there are a lot of different problems, but it's, it's rooted in preaching. Preaching has to be rooted in preaching the cross. Not that, not that my, I'm about, my shift is about to come, I'm about to shift. I got a new season. My cup gonna overflow, you know, um, I'm about, I'm, I'm about to get this kind of health wealth teaching that that's really um, 
is, is, is really, really relevant among us today without it being rooted in the cross. Uh, every blessing that I get, it has to come from the cross. It has to come from the preaching of the cross. Not that, uh, not, not that uh, you, God is about to shift you into a new season, you know, and so kind of create these scenarios of health and wealth uh, in our preaching that is not rooted in the cross. And I'm telling you, you might have a new season. Your cup may overflow. You may have another shift, but you may not. <laughs> and so part yeah. of the issue is this, this new kind of preaching is, that's, that's culturally demanded by people because mm. we're in a pandemic mm. and people we, we cannot give people a false hope. Mm. <laughs> Not in terms of cultural shift. Our hope is in the cross. And that we're right. we, we going to die, our bodies going to be met, buried, but one day we're going to resurrect and be with the Lord. That has to be the foundation of our preaching. And for me, sometimes that's problematic because we get people excited about something that has no substance. Oh, Ohio's in good shape. Toledo, yeah. Ohio. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm from Dayton, but my hands are raised for Toledo. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. sir. Bird to, Dr. Bird. Bird need to give me my notes back. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I, hey, look, and I know Jeff was going to say that. I knew he was going to say that. <laughs> I need to give me my notes back, man. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, um, I, I would say this before we close, before I, you know, I, I'm through. Um, <laughs> don't lose the identity of the church Amen. by neglecting to appreciate the whole story presented to us in the Bible. Here's what I mean by that. What's going on in Churches of Christ is not isolated to Churches of Christ. Many right. faith fellowships are experiencing the same thing. Yeah. Don't sell the soul of the church trying right. to please a generation. Right. Let the book of Judges be a, a guide. I learned this from Harold Red when I first came to Memphis back in 1982. He says everything going on in the Bible in the Old Testament is going on in the church today. Back yeah. in that day, brother. Brother Harris and myself and, and, and Red were all at Harding Graduate School at the same time. They were they were older men than I, I, I was, and they helped me out a lot. They brought me, no, but uh, they, but it's true. The <laughs> yeah. book of Judges says to us that you have a generation that's real faithful, and then you have not. a generation that's not. not I had a youth minister tell me in Troy, Alabama, some 25 years ago, he said, it's amazing to me. I've been working with youth for 30 years. I'll have, a, I'll have children from the same family come in and one generation, they'll read the Bible, they'll sing, they'll work in the church. And from the same family, just five years later, somebody comes and they don't care a thing about the Bible. He says, don't ever forget this. Every decade in the church is not going to be the same. Every generation is not going to be the same. Don't sell the identity of the church trying to please a generation. We have a generation of people who may not be as interested in the Bible, right. who may not be as interested in assembly for worship, but we still appreciate the prayer of Jesus. Sanctify them through your truth. We are different. Unify them as we are and then glorify them. And I'll say this, Jesus said, all, we sing that song, all the glory belongs to you. All the glory belongs to you. Don't forget, Jesus has glory. The Father has glory. And Jesus said in John 17, 22, the glory which I had with you, I want you to give that glory to the church. Understand, people, there's glory in the church. Don't yeah. denigrate the church. Don't put down the church. Don't dismiss the church. Don't sell the church. There is the glory of God in his church, and it does not matter whether any generation accepts it or not. Let's be who it's God has called season, us to be. Not a season. That's right. Uh, uh, Lord, mighty good. Mighty good. Lord. Mighty good. Mighty good. As, as we close out. Um, someone asked the question on the chat, is the church a hood or a brotherhood? We, we are. Oh, we, yeah, we are a brotherhood now. You know, you know? You know where you're from. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not a hood, though. Now, now there may be some hood in the brotherhood. Some hood. <laughs> We're a brotherhood. Saying, don't, don't be wearing all that red around me. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, put some hood. We just have to admit, we got some work to do, guys. <laughs> We, we, we got some work, and, and, and let's be thankful that we got some work to do, you know, uh, but we got to be serious about it. You know, we, we, you know, one of the passages that stand out to me is 2 Timothy 2, 2, 2 yeah. when Paul told Tim, the things that you've heard among heard me, among, yes, among many witnesses, and the, the same commit thou to who? Faithful, faithful men. men. 
who Jesus. shall be able to teach us also. Don't That's buy right. into this, this concept that what we were taught was I'm just so Right. Out of out in left field and wrong because that's where false doctrine creeps Mercy. in. Mercy. So so we we are brotherhood. You know, uh, I think uh, Brother Carruthers just mentioned when I started my doctoral uh, study, I, I, I'm in a room full of Baptists. I'm the only Church of Christ, mm -hmm. but they have the same problems we have. Exactly. <laughs> you know, uh, one of the guys ran into trouble in his ministry. Few a few uh, sessions later, I'm in trouble. You know, so we 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 experience the same thing. But truth is truth, and the Church of Christ is right. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and we got to yeah. buy into that right. and, and not fall for any deceptiveness. Mm -hmm. You know, this is good, Doctor Bert, Brother Doss, Brother Gilbert, Doctor Carruthers. Thank you, sirs, for sharing with us. Um, uh, we we need to. Re, uh, revisit this probably in another format. Uh, and I hear that the ladies are having a great time over there. And I got a couple text messages that, that they are outstanding. Uh, and, and we were outstanding this morning. So I, I think we're about ready to go back to Robin for the final sessions. Uh, again, my hats off to everybody for what you shared, the way you shared it and how you helped us. God bless you brothers. I'm going to turn it over back to brother Mitchell now. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Brother Crusoe. The ladies' breakout room is ending now, so Joshua, if you would bring up the uh, promo video as the sisters make their way back into the general session. my own camera <laughs> okay all righty uh, all righty uh, are we back brother mitchell everybody's back on yes sir we're back yes, sir. all right great 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 dr harris is dr harris on okay all right i've seen there um i'm trusting that the ladies just were uh had an out, uh, awesome experience. I know the men did. I I I I, I received a couple texts and uh, that the ladies were just outstanding. The moderator was great. Oh man, the question and uh, the brothers. We 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 got a brotherhood, y'all. We, we said there were some hoods in the brothers in the brotherhood, but it's still a brotherhood. And uh, we 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 addressed some issues. This was good. This was really good. I, I want to thank everybody for their patience as we navigated through um, some some areas uh, this morning. It's my great honor to introduce um, the president of the School of Religious Studies, a significant figure in our in our brotherhood. And I'm going to read through uh, his brief bio. Um, on, on this morning. But again, uh, I want to thank uh, the panelists, both on the men and the women. I can't wait to listen to that women's panel. And I, I, I want the sisters to take a listen to what the men have to say as well. 
Well, Lord Clay Harris was born in Homer, Louisiana on May 21st, 1949 to Henry Clyde and Myrtle Beatrice Harris. He married Aura May Newsom on June 1, 1969, thus entering into a loving relationship that produced three children, Clay Malloyd, Dexter Wayne, and Orena Lacay, eight grandchildren and four great grands. When Lord Harris crossed the Mississippi River into Greenville, Mississippi, he saw something that painted an indelible picture in his mind and left an impression that he could not shake. He saw scores of souls destitute of the gospel and young men with a desire to preach, but no training or experience. He felt compelled to do something about it that would not require that they pack up and leave their jobs and homes and families. Hence, the School of Religious Studies was founded in 1978. He invited men from various walks of life, prisons and jails, communities nearby and transients. The soil for conversions was fertile and he wanted to take full advantage of it by expanding the team of soul winners. So the school began with a curriculum of evangelism and in time moved to a full curriculum to offer the Associate of Bible Ministry. Dr. Harris created the SRS Evangelism to both provide training and experience for its students and to aid congregations to be more effective in evangelism. Having attended both undergraduate and graduate study, Dr. Harris had an idea of the kind of courses that uh, needed to be offered and developed a two-year curriculum for training men. Part of his mission was to reinvigorate the zeal for an effectiveness in evangelism. Therefore, every student would have to be engaged in evangelism and take that training with them to the congregations they would eventually serve. Instructors, instructors and students would travel to congregations to teach and work with them in soul winning. They even went into areas where there was no congregation and left a congregation when they departed. Dr. Harris received a bachelor degree from Stephen F. Austin State University in Nacogdoches, Texas and the master's degree from Harding University School of Theology in Memphis, Tennessee. The honorary doctor of Christian education was bestowed on him for his work in Christian education. Dr. Harris was the director and one of the instructors of SRS from its exception, having studied Bible and religion, ministry and business in the college and university. The title president was bestowed on him by the board of directors in 1987, when the school made its transition to Moss Point, Mississippi. While in Mississippi, the school was chartered by the state and its credentials were received by other colleges and universities. During the course of his ministry, Dr. Harris has served churches in Louisiana, Texas, Miss Mississippi, and has been serving the McAlmit Church of Christ in North Little Rock since 1999. Additionally, he has served as campaign director for the NL Evans campaigns. And in 1989, Dr. Harris was appointed evangelism director for the Churches of Christ Crusade, which was headed by Dr. Daniel Harrison, and thereby leads mass evangelism efforts across the United States. He also co-founded the International American Medical Missions and was named the Counseling and Evangelism Director for the mission, which has conducted missions in the United States, Haiti, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Belize, and Jamaica. The missions together, uh, the missions bring together medical teams to serve the body counseling to serve the heart, and evangelism to serve the soul. What an impressive bio, what a mighty man of God, a great mentor, instructor, preacher, husband, 
Father, just a great man. It's my honor to introduce and present the president of the School of Religious Studies, Dr. Lloyd Clay Harris. I am honored and humbled to speak to this august audience who meet us from across the country. I am eternally indebted to Dr. Crusoe who has led the process of this lectureship and developed and brought together a tremendous core of presenters, both the ladies program and the men's program. I'm indebted to the churches of Christ throughout the United States for the favor that they have bestowed upon me and the school and the students who have been received by churches and colleges and universities across this land. I'm indebted to God who has walked with me through the journey. And I must admit that the walk has not been alone for there are others who have walked together with me as we made the journey. Thank each of you for being here today. I want to thank the staff of the SRS for the tremendous support and the work behind the scenes that has helped to bring all of these things together. And I'll be remiss if I did not express profound gratitude to Robin Mitchell, the genius of technology, and to his staff for providing us with a superb and efficient process in this lecture series. And I've listened to the, all of the lectures and presentations and the discussions and my soul wanted me to just start singing, but I knew because of my limitations in vocal, I would probably dismiss the audience if I tried to hit a note. And so I ask you to, to, to allow me to speak with you today. I want to speak on the subject today, prepare, preparation for confrontation, preparing God's people for the edifying of the body and empowering God's people by God's power. That is the mission of the School of Religious Studies. It was adopted by the Board of Directors many years ago and has remained the mission of the school. In 1978, there was a famine in the land, a famine for the word of God, for a certain group of young, energetic, and excited men who sold themselves to the Lord with the knowledge of the word and no experience in serving redeemed people. The concept of preparation had been harnessed on me as I had been invited as a youth to speak on the subject, preparation, the key to effective service. That work in preparing and presenting that message placed within my heart a yearning to fulfill the mandate of the lesson that I had worked to deliver and the truths that I had learned in the process. Sometime after that, I ran across the book of Amos chapter four and verse 12 hearing God talk to his people through the prophet Amos, who reminds me of my upbringing, not a city preacher, not schooled and polished as many are in the city, but grew up on a farm raising cows and hogs and plowing fields. But I have a sense of what Amos must have felt and how God's word must have impacted him as it has impacted me. And reading Amos 4.12, I began to realize two important things. First, that Israel had disregarded God's efforts to restore her. And second, that they would soon have to face him for their actions. I came to realize <clears throat> that this is true for all generations and for all persons, regardless of status, age, or other distinctions. Nothing that we could use as a resume of our own selves can separate us from the reality that we will have to face God. We have an appointment with him 
that can be a confrontation depending on where we stand in relationship to God and his holy divine word. This is a 44 caliber double barrel shotgun. Each barrel aims at a different audience and a different target. And the intention of opposite efforts is at the core. In the fourth chapter of Amos, I connect with the fourth chapter of the epistle to the Ephesians. One speaks of an audience existed hundreds of years before. The other speaks of an audience then and that exists hundreds of years later. The profound message to one is that the preparation was determined by the end of a relationship that was destined to happen. The message to the other is that the preparation can ignite and initiate a relationship that will never end. Both of these messages speak to us today by reminding us of what Amos had said to his generation and then what Paul said to his generation. To one, he was forecasting the demise, the fall, and the end of that place with him. And though it would be quite some time before it would happen, it would certainly come to pass, and they, as his chosen, would be no more, despite the belief in many that God did not end the relationship with Israel that he had from the time of Mount Sinai. But I'm convinced not only by Amos, but by all the prophets that followed him, that God did indeed end that relationship. It was destined to end for two reasons. One, because Israel did not fulfill that side of the body. And two, because the original plan of God was to bring about a whole new thing that Israel was to be the conduit to bring about. They did, in fact, bring Christ into the world, but they did not honor the commitments that God and they had made together. For they signed off on what God had promised them in Exodus chapter 19. When Moses came down from the mountain and gave them the terms of God for their national relationship with him, and they said all that God said we would do. They signed off from what Moses said in the book of Deuteronomy, when God reminded them if they fulfilled the commands that he had given him, that he would fulfill all the promises that he had made. But if they failed, he would bring them to an end. They failed, and God did what he had promised. That was the first barrel of this shotgun. To another group, totally a new people, a new mission, a new priesthood, a new message would arise from the grave with a body drenched and washed in blood and an infusion of new blood in the vein and a new sacrifice for their sins and a new temple to worship not made with mortar, stone, and wood, decked with gold and silver, but comprised of fleshly ornaments of willing subjects who would become the decor of this temple through the hearts and lives of faith of those who would have surrendered to their Savior. The Savior of this new people is the Son of Israel's Savior, the Savior of the old people. His Son, the Savior, the new Savior, the eternal Savior would dwell among his people and bear their burdens and beckon them to worship and serve Yahweh, Elohim, Jehovah, El Shaddai, Adonai, Lord God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. Amos 4 opens with the statement, hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who suppress the poor, who curse the needy who say to their husbands, bring wine, let us drink. The cows of Bashan are well-fed, fat cows. Those were the, the people of God in the ancient days who saw themselves as successful, prosperous people of wealth and integrity among men. But by the cows of Bashan, Amos actually meant the rich, the voluptuous, and the violent inhabitants of Samaria who practiced false worship and who went about their service without sincerity toward God and who actually eventually turned away from God despite the fact that God had been their God 
through the days. And God tells them that he will take you away with fish hooks and your posterity with fish hooks. And you will go out through the broken walls and each one straight ahead of and you will be cast into harmony, says the Lord. Why does God say this? Why is God giving this instruction to them? They're going to face him. There's going to be a confrontation. And God had attempted in every way to prepare them for what was about to happen. He says it because they would come to Bethel to transgress, not to give God glory and honor. They would come to Gilgal to multiply their transgressions, not to submit and armor themselves and prostrate themselves before God in genuine submission to his holy and divine will. And God said in all of this, you have not returned to me, said the Lord. I've sent all kinds of warnings and inducements to get you to change, but you did not listen. You did not turn back and you still rebel against me. And for this, you love your children of Israel. You love the things that I hate. And obviously you hate the things that I love. That was to that people. And the first barrel went off and the Israel first went into captivity. Even at the end of the captivity, the lessons they were to learn had not been learned, and they did not honor God as they should have. And for some 400 years, they continued to go further and further away from God until the Savior, the Son of the first Savior, actually came into this world, drenched in the blood from the cross of Calvary, and resurrected from the grave in which he had gone in order to meet them in death that he might raise them up in life. But they said no to God, as they had said in the ages before. But God in this incident of bringing the young Savior who would die on that cross, reached out to a whole new people, a generation who would hear the word of the gospel, who believe in the son who came from on high and who would submit to him and honor him. The sadness that comes to my heart is that in this new message and this new people, we have found ourselves in a famine for the word of God. And we have seen the lack of attention to the word, the lack of seeking after the word, the lack of standing upon the word to be the basis of our greatest downfalls, downfalls as men, downfalls as a society, and even downfalls in the church. We could be much further out of religion than we are. But our attention to the word has been lax, and in many cases, non-existent at all. And for this, we would have to answer in a confrontation with God. And so after this Savior, uh, the son of the ancient Savior has come, who claimed on the clouds of heaven before the ancient of days, that was given him a kingdom and power and glory, and this glory and this kingdom would never fail and would never pass away, as prophesied in Daniel chapter 7. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul being given the confirmation by God and the ministry to preach the word, said, I therefore the prison of the Lord beseech you, that you are worthy of vocation, whether you are called in all lowness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father with all and above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us has given grace according uh, to his purpose and his measure of the gift of God. Now Paul is going to transition into a message in which the second barrel is going to be released. The first barrel was released for destruction. The second barrel is released for salvation. For Paul says to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter four and verse number 11, that he gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying, of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer 
be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plottings. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in him in all things with the head, even Christ. The mission of this second battle was to bring hope and security to this people who are headed by the Savior from Calvary. The tragedy is that too often we have not listened to Paul's message. It was designed to protect us from every wind of doctrine and slate of man that would cause us to fault in our step, to turn away from the truth, to abandon the faith. And unfortunately, our history is self-revealing that we have not allowed the blast of that second barrel to touch our hearts. Somehow, we have ducked it, we have stepped aside, and we have missed it. Maybe we thought the bullets were intended for death and did not know that they were intended for life. Maybe we want to set our own standard, or maybe society is dictating to us what we ought to think. And I'm glad that I had written my message before I heard the panel so that I would not be accused of being a parasite in the preparation of a word. He himself gave them to the church. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, and the teachers not to be big men, not for their own glory, and not for their own sense of importance. But he gave them that the church might be secured, might be fed, and it might continue being built up in the holy faith which he had given, the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ, the equipping, the preparing of them for the work that was ahead, the work of ministry, the involvement by them of doing those things that God would have them to know and to do. That was the profound message and mission of God. I submit you today that this is the story of the School of Religious Studies, training men for the edifying of the body of Christ, for the empowering of God's people by God's power, so that there will be no famine in the land that men will not be prepared for the confrontation with God. I believe that God gave me a vision for the work of the School of Religious Studies when I crossed the Mississippi River from Texas through Arkansas into Mississippi. The street I came in the city on was the street the church that I would preach for actually existed on. And so I, had, I just crossed the river and passed by the building from which I will be delivering the sermons and providing the teaching for years to come. I submit that what I saw on that street, in that city, and cities surrounding them were pivotal in what we're doing today. I'm thankful for the privilege that we've had to make this journey. For the men that needed the teaching, several men came to me. I taught men who were in prison. One of the strangest things happened is that I went to the jail to minister to inmates and they discovered what I was doing. They provided for me a place in the jail to set up a training program for young men who were incarcerated and they might be taught the gospel of Christ and trained to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And those men came out of the jails, came to the facilities and engaged in further studies of the word. I have no answer for why and how that came about. I do have an answer to the significance that it has for us and that it can have for a time to come. SRS began in 1978. We saw men who had four missions to improve their own academic, social, and occupational circumstances to prepare themselves for excellence in their chosen fields, 
to serve humanity in a positive way and to lay a foundation for the rest of their lives. We wanted to be a part of that. We wanted the church to embrace that. And we wanted to provide training that was accessible to them. Why was it not accessible? Why was it so difficult for them to get this training? Most of the schools of preaching of that day required that the students take up roots, leave their jobs, their families, their congregations, and go off to school and then go around begging for support. And if that support did not come, then the tragedy would be to them. I saw what happened in a situation like that. I saw a young man give up his job, which was taking care of him, and the congregation, which was assisting him, and left his family behind and went on off. He had been there semester after semester with no support, hungry and struggling. He would find himself in desperate moments. His wife had reached the point where she had very little to say in his behalf. And this struggled him so greatly that they found him dead by his own hands. I preached his funeral, and it brought tears to my eyes that we could create a situation that would put somebody in a worse case than they were when we found them. Our vision was that we would take the journey together and that those whom we touched would not be left to the side to back, fend for themselves alone. Even if we found them in trouble, we would bear with them in the trouble. And so the school has done that 44 years this year. And since that time, we have been blessed with a board of directors who have stood by the school from its very inception and have not left the side, buying into the mission and the value system of the school. One of the things that I'd like to do today is to step out of Amos's picture, which he did not get a chance to commend the people of his day because they did not turn. And despite all that God did, he kept saying, yet have you not returned to me, said the Lord. And I'd like to step into Paul's picture, who gave hope to believers with a future, asking them to be edified, to be built up, and to engage in ministry. And I'd like to recognize the fact that some have taken advantage of that offer. I'd like to acknowledge those who have taken advantage of that. And uh, with the assistance of the tech director, if you would give me access to my screen, I would like now to pull up off of my screen uh, to show it. Can I be, can I get access to showing my screen? What you see here is something that we started working on back in February when we had the SRS conference recognizing black leaders in religion and black leaders in the church. We wanted to show black leaders in the community as well as in religion. This is, this hall has been set aside by the School of Religious Studies as a hall of remembrance. Inside, what you're going to see are the pictures and profiles. The first people to be inducted into the SRS Hall of Remembrance. The plaques are already ready to post, and some of them are already on the wall. The room has already been prepared. 
the area has already been set aside. We could not do this in our previous time because of building limitations, but we have now reached the point where we are actually putting on the wall these plaques being installed as outstanding and black leaders in religion. The first to be installed are the members of the board of directors for 43 years. Notice this, during these years, the school never received government funds and never received support from Caucasians and other ethnicities. The entire support of the School of Religious Studies has come from African-Americans. And as a result of that, we stand with those who have stood through the years. Dr. Michael Alexander is being enshrined. Boardman Darcy Burton, Boardman General Burton. Uh, Darcy Burton is the treasurer for the Board of Directors. General Burton is the chairman of the Board of Directors. Boardman Leonardo Gilbert, who is the Institutional Development Director on the Board of Directors. Edward and Levian Gooch, board members. Jefferson, Jeffers Jefferson, who is the chairman of the facility development for the Board of, for the board of Directors. Ezell Landrum, Theodore Marshall, Dr. Billy Moore, who is the chairman of the finance department of the Board of Directors. Jasper Newsom, Dr. David Penn, who's the chairman of the academic committee of the board of directors, and Johnny Shen, who is the secretary of the board of directors. These men will be installed and are being installed. In fact, uh, the, the uh, plaques for the installation is already in the hall and the hall will be open uh, in the February men's conference. It will be open and we'll invite people to actually come to visit the Hall of Remembrance. School is also enshrining Dara Holt, the first graduate of the School of Religious Studies, whose ministry led him around the world. He, is, he graduated from the school with honors. He preached throughout the country. He established congregations. He converted a complete denominational church with a minister choir and members. He has held and trained other men to preach and conducted international campaigns, written several books, uh, and one of the most prolific uh, students coming out of the school. And uh, he will be enshrined in the Hall of Remembrance. Dr. Steve Williams, who passed recently, but Dr. Williams in introduced and established the counseling division for the School of Religious Studies, which did not have a counseling program prior to his coming. And for many years, served the school as a member of the advisory board and then a member of the board of directors and was serving faithfully on that board using his influence for the school. N.L. Evans, who was on the very first board of the School of Religious Studies, who was my mentor and trainer as a boy preacher and who stood by me and was with me throughout the entire career until he came to the end of his life. He is being enshrined as a leader in the community and religion in the School of Religious Studies Hall of Remembrance. The, cha the chairman of the SRS lectureship of this week, this, this year, Dr. James Michael Crusoe is being enshrined in the Hall of Remembrance for his leadership service to the community, the founding of two 501c3 organizations, executive director and retirement organization, ministry author, educator, and, and a just adjunct professor for the School of Religious Studies, recognized and acknowledged for his outstanding dedication and leadership, both in the church and the community, and recognized for his service in religion, education, and its impact in the community. It is with eternal gratitude that he is being recognized as a black leader in the community and in religion. Uh, you see that his book entitled Somebody Must Come Preaching uh, came out recently. He has other 
uh, literary works that he has been responsible for. One of our graduates, Willie McCall, SRS recognizes and acknowledges this is outstanding and dedicated uh, leadership in both the church and the community. And Willie was very uh, instrumental in the SRS campaign team, which traveled around the country, helping congregation develop uh, evangelistic ministries and helping to establish congregations and actually reached the point where he could actually lead the campaigns himself and is with eternal gratitude uh, that we celebrate him as a black leader in religion. We celebrate Dr. Edward Robinson, who's recognized and acknowledged for his outstanding and dedicated leadership, both in the church and the community. Uh, therefore, he's recognized for his service in religion, education, authorship, and guidance. Dr. Edward Robinson has a long history of successful venues. He has a number of books out. He's a leader in, in uh, academia and literary works in reference to the Black community, and, and he has written books concerning uh, Black men. And one of his books recognized the achievements of religious organizations among Black uh, members of the society. And he has been enshrined in the SRS Hall of Remembrance. Uh, distinguished Black leaders in the community include David and Rachel Johnson, who established a, a faith-based uh, organization uh, this organization serves the community uh, through found, funding uh, the Charleston Community Impact and nonprofit community-based organization that is committed to empowering people and building partnerships to serve under-resourced and at-risk communities. And of course, he, they're being recognized for that effective service uh, in that community in Carolina. Uh, Tamika Moore, who has worked in the outstanding services, acknowledged in reference to her service both in the church as she has established uh, faith-based organizations uh, that uh, in the church as well as work with uh, community organizations to have an impact in the community. And therefore, uh, she's presently uh, working with Boys and Girls Clubs of McGee, Arkansas, uh, which she has uh, be, uh, since, be prior to that, was working for uh, Boys and Girls Clubs in the uh, Pine Bluff area, along with creating a service designed to help children navigate uh, certain aspects of that journey. And she's being recognized. Uh, Deborah Rhodes, and many of you will know her, who is uh, the North Little Rock uh, per, uh, president of the NAACP, and she's acknowledged for outstanding and dedicated leadership, both in the community and the church, and therefore is recognized for her service and impact in the community as a Black leader in the community. Michael Williams is being distinguished because of his work, both in the community as well as in religion. And uh, he is also an author of a very significant book, uh, dealing with the subject of Black innocence, serves on many boards, and both college boards, community boards, organizational boards, and other organizations designed for the improvement of this community, recognized and acknowledged for outstanding dedication in the church, as well as the community. He also serves as a deacon of the Macau Church of Christ, and is also a supporter in, for the School of Religious Studies. And of course, in the area of religion, education and the community and we honor his service at this time uh, the board has also determined that they would like to include uh, the name of this young man because he is, he is the president of the school of religious studies and uh humbly i accept that insight in insistence that my name be included in this that's not something that i would have done on my own uh, this induction of the these men and women will be uh, completed when all of the plaques are uh, on, on place, and they will all be in place prior to the opening of the conference in February. Uh, the facility has already been set aside. The building has already been transformed. Everything is in place for uh, the induction. We will look forward to having a physical view of this process uh, in our next visit with you. Thank you for giving me the time both to talk about of the mission of preparing ourselves for the confrontation with God and for 
been able to talk about the School of Religious Studies. And I appreciate the time that you've given me today and your present participation in this lectureship venue. Again, thank Dr. Crusoe for his leadership in this process. Well, let the church say amen. <laughs> um, Dr. Harris, oh, we, we applaud you for your great work and, and your vision. And um, it's, just, it's just really hard to come with the words, you know, when a, when a man or when a, a person has a vision and that vision is to serve God and then that vision becomes uh, a reality um, and it's a reality that you can see in your lifetime. You know, there are things that people do and it doesn't come uh, to fruition until after they're gone. But God has blessed you, Bill Harris, uh, not only to uh, develop a vision, but to live, to see that vision become a reality. So we, we applaud you uh, for your great work, sacrifice that you've made, and not only just you, but your family as well, and those who have been around you to support uh, your ministry and your vision. Uh, I said on yesterday, we had uh, maybe uh, two goals. We actually had three goals. Uh, the first goal and objective uh, was to make uh, God look good. We wanted to give God glory uh, with this year's lectureship. And, and then uh, the second and third vision are interrelated. We wanted to make Brother Harris look good and the School of Religious Studies. So a lot was on stake uh, uh, this year. Of course, we always want to give honor and praise to God Almighty, uh, but the confidence that Brother Harris placed in, in us, we wanted him to look good and we wanted the school to look good. And by doing that, uh, we want to give God the glory. We want to expose the School of Religious Studies and let uh, our brotherhood know or remind our brotherhood that the school does exist and the good that they have done. A lot of work, Dr. Harris, and God has been good to you, and we're thankful for that. Now, as we get ready to close out, I know you guys are taking a deep breath. Finally, we get to close out. But 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 I want to say, what a better way to spend uh, a Saturday morning, you know, I, I know there's a lot of things that you could do, could be doing, uh, but but we're, we're spending this Saturday, you know, just look at it as though uh, you went to a football game, basketball game, baseball game. Well, in football and basketball, it went into overtime and just look at it like we went into triple overtime. And uh, if it was baseball, extra innings. I remember when I was in Memphis went to one of the Grizzly games and they were playing the Oklahoma Thunder. That's when uh, I think KD was still with them. And the game went into double, double overtime. And uh, I didn't get home till like after one in the morning. So Crusoe wasn't worried or bothered or nothing. I just checked to say it's in overtime. Well, we're in overtime right now. And what we're going to do is close out with two of two graduates from the School of Religious Studies. I think Dr. Bird, Dr. Krell, and myself all have taught these young men uh, or they've taken classes from us. Uh, the first one up is Brother Marquis Ingram. He, he preaches for the Cherokee Church of Christ in Cherokee, Alabama. Uh, he's 32 years old, uh, a graduate of the School of Religious Study. He is originally from Macon, Mississippi, but he moved to North Little Rock in 2015 to attend the School of Religious Studies. He lived on campus and he attended the 15th Street Church of Christ under the leadership of James Gentry, who's also the dean at the School of Religious Studies. From 2017 to 2019, he was the youth minister at the 9th Street Church of Christ in Paducah, Tucky. He now resides in Cherokee, Alabama, where he serves as the minister of the Cherokee Church of Christ. So Brother Ingram, we're ready. And for the sake of time, we're just gonna bring you on without a versatile song. Uh, we're gonna ask you to come on in your own way. 
and deliver the message that you have been assigned. I, I believe it's prepare to meet thy God. So at this time, we present and introduce our brother Marquis Ingram of the Cherokee Church of Christ in Cherokee, Cherokee, Alabama. Well, I want to thank you, uh, thank Brother Lord Harris. Uh, I appreciate the School of Religious Studies, and ever since I had, ever since SRS came into my life, my life hasn't, my life haven't been the same. So, and I know I just put it in the chat box a little while ago that I'm, I thank the Lord for SRS. And, and when I when I became a student of SRS, when when I immediately found out I wasn't just a student at a regular at a school, but I was joining a family. So I want Brother Lord and Brother James and all of those SRS to know that I am definitely grateful to be a part of SRS. And my life has not been the same since. Uh, I, I send, I come to uh, send greetings, uh, Cherokee Church of Christ here in Cherokee, Alabama. And one of the things that I always try to encourage uh, uh, the congregation here uh, and what we stand for uh, is the truth is always right, but people always matter. And can't live the truth if you don't love people. And truth and love cannot be separated. I want to, I think so, I thank uh, everybody. Uh, I want to say also, I'm so, I had I had a great time listening to all of the men of God who presented their lessons uh, ever since going back to Thursday night. I just had a wonderful time listening to everyone. And I feel uh, very encouraged and edified uh, from all of the lessons that have been presented. And I'm so thankful to be partaking uh, in today's lecture. Uh, the assigned topic that has been given to me uh, is to prepare to meet thy God. And my uh, verses that I have been given is in Amos chapter four, uh, verses 11 through 13. Uh, uh, if I had to give this, if I had to give this lesson a subtitle, the subtitle that I would give this lesson is the downfall of a desensitized people. The downfall of a desensitized people. And the word desensitized has the idea of when you lose all sensitivity, where you no longer feel that when the mind becomes desensitized, things become normalized that shouldn't be uh, normalized. And the reason why that is so important, what is uh, in the uh, going in the, in the days of Amos and what it was happening to the Northern Kingdom, they had become desensitized to corruption and they had become desensitized to paganism. And a, desen a, a desensitized mind leads to a defiled conscience. So when I, if our minds become desensitized, our conscience ain't no good. Paul says uh, in Timothy when he talks about that uh, 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 that those that the truth with those who no longer see the value in truth, uh, they become uh, they come they become seared. What uh, uh what uh, they 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 conscience become seared. And then what that means when your conscience becomes seared, the demons own your mind. But what had, what had happened to the Northern Kingdom, they had become desensitized to the paganism in the land. God had given Israel over to the Assyrians to discipline them going back to 2 Kings uh, 13 and uh, verse five. And, and but I wanna, I'm, I'm, and if we look at my, my verses this morning and, and Amos 4, 11 through 13. Uh, in verse 11, it says, I overthrew some of, some of you as I overthrew Solomon and Gomorrah, and you were like a burning stick snatched from a fire, yet you do not return to me. This is the Lord's declaration. My first point I want to mention this morning, the people of God must not fight the discipline of the Lord. The people of God must not fight the discipline of the Lord. See, Israel was overthrown by God's discipline because uh, the text says, I overthrew uh, some of you as Solomon uh, and Gomorrah. And, and the reason why that is so, the reason why that's so important uh, that Israel was such an immoral decline and desensitization that they had to face the same wrath 
uh, that Solomon and Gomorrah had to face. But the difference in with Solomon and Gomorrah and their punishment is that uh, God, uh, God said through the prophet uh, 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 Amos, he said that you were like a burning stick snatched from the fire. That means that I could have took all of y'all out, but I still had my mercy wanted to save some of y'all. Now, the difference that happened with Solomon and Gomorrah, God took everybody out that was in Solomon and Gomorrah. And, and, and a man's lot wife and lot's wife got caught up in too because she, she turned back and looked when she was supposed to keep going. But they had to face the same wrath that the Solomon and Gomorrah had to face. And, and going back to Genesis 19, uh, verse 24 and 25, those who, I'm not, and, and that same word overthrew, uh, God used that same word again in, in Genesis 19, uh, verses 24 and 25. In Genesis 19, verses 24 and 25, when God was pronouncing the judgment and the, the punishment on uh, Solomon and Gomorrah, uh, the text says in Genesis 19, verses 24 uh, and 25, then out of the sky, the Lord rained on Solomon and Gomorrah, uh, burning so far from the Lord. He demolished those these cities and the, uh, the entire plain and all of the inhabitants of the city and whatever grew on the ground. Then, of course, verse 26, but life but Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. And the reason, and the, looking at all of these, Solomon and Gomorrah was not only a morally dead place, but it became a, a, a land of mockery because they not only just was living evil and wicked in the sight of God, and they had no remorse for their wickedness. And when people have no remorse for their wickedness, it is mockery in the sight of God. What Jeroboam had in, uh, influence on the Northern Kingdom and the Northern tribe was a pagan based political structure that was set up to make religion and the worship of Yahweh to be dictated by politics and paganism thrives where politics takes the place of the word of God. And us as the Lord's church, we must not be dictated by politics, but we must allow the word of God to dictate politics. And when politics di uh, uh, dictates us, we become desensitized to the paganism in the land. It's very important to recognize that God, God also not only uses eternal judgment, but God also uses immediate judgment. God uses present judgment on his people. We live in times where God's people have been desensitized being a political flesh focused people rather than spirit uh, gospel focused people. When the people of God are sick, you know, this is a word that calls synchronism or to be secretized. Uh, you know, we living in times now that means that I got to uh, I got to mix up with the land and I just can't be a standalone person. We got to understand Christianity cannot be mixed with the land because Christianity is transformed from the land. So we must understand, church, that we cannot allow our Christianity to be mixed with the land. When the people of God synchronizes with pagan, the pagan structure of the land, then we will end up no better than Sodom and Gomorrah. Israel didn't respond to the mercy of God. And going back to Amos 4, verse 11, God he was trying to say to Amos, you, were like, uh, you was like a burning stick snatched from a fire, yet you still did not respond to me. So not only did God punish, had to punish them through his judgment, but at the same time that he was still showing his mercy. Because he, because he did not allow his people to face the immediate destruction as Solomon and Gomorrah did. And y'all, I want to tell you, in our times today, I know that we know that times are bad and, and all of that, you know, the coronavirus and we living in such times that we're not used to, but things are not as bad as it could be. Because even in the midst of tragedy, God's mercy still has control. When he says snatched out of fire, God allowed a remnant of survivors to be delivered, to testify, and to recognize the error of their moral standing, and so that they can change. Zechariah chapter three, 
in Zechariah chapter 3, verses number 2, the Bible says, The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. May the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is it this man a burning stick snatched from a fire? See, the Lord disciplined his people so that his people can transform and change and let go of the paganism of the land. See, us as God's people, we have to recognize the Lord's mercy and that the things that are going on in, our, in this world today could be worse and that politics is not the answer. We live in times now where people put their trust in everything outside of the word of God and everything outside of the character of God and everything outside of the power of God. Jesus is the answer. The gospel is the answer, not politics, not what, what comes from the world. What comes from the world can never be the answer because Jesus is our answer. And we must not, we must not, we must not, we must not fail to recognize. And if we do fail to recognize, how we are to challenge the political paganism of the land, we will be in the same condition as Israel unprepared to meet the Lord. It's hard to truly appreciate the favor of heaven when so many, if, if I'm not trying to appease or, or, or scribe and labor for the favor of heaven, then the only thing left is the favor of the land. And Lord have mercy, we got it so much, even amongst our people today, that they are, they rather win the favor of the land more than strive for the favor of heaven. We live in times where social status, recognition, and all of these things are taking precedent over the righteousness of God. My second point, a desensitized people must deal with God's retribution and meeting with him. See, disobedient Israel had to deal with meeting the Lord in judgment. We live in a sin desensitized world that folks go around, and I know this is a saying that folks always say, only God can judge me. When people use that phrase, only God can judge me. Now, yes, I know we have some judgmental folks that don't give people mercy and they don't know how to live with mercy. But at the same time, that phrase, only God can judge me, is only a poor excuse for unrighteous living. And see, what was happening to Israel, going into verse 12, when he says, Therefore, Israel, this is what I will do to you. Since I will do to you, Israel, prepare to meet your God. See, what happened to Israel is that they were not only desensitized, but they were distracted. And not only distracted and desensitized, they failed to examine themselves. And we, we must understand, uh, brethren, that we, mu we must not only get into the word and examine the word, but we must allow the word to examine us. In 1 Corinthians 11, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31, Paul makes this same argument when he was concluding his uh, teaching about the Lord's Supper. In 1 first, first Corinthians 11, verse 31, Paul says, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 31, the Bible says, if we properly judge ourselves, we will not be judged. Why you say that, Paul? Because when you stay in recognition of your error, you don't have to run from yourself. And sometimes we get so caught up in the corruption in the land because we live, we live in a land that was Satan and all that we, the entertainment and all of these things. The, uh, and I know that, you know, people are sports fans and all of that. But sometimes we must not allow the world to become our distraction. Because when I get caught up in the distraction of the world, I'm always looking for a distraction. Rather than examining myself and examining those things that I need to change. See, God had to meet his people to stop them. And God has to meet us to stop us. When God meets, when God meets you, there will be nowhere to run. And I and I can, as someone that used to run from God, I know I can attest to this that for so long before I came back to the Lord's church and I got around folks that 
I, I got around folks that was keeping me distracted. I didn't want to deal with my pain. I didn't want to deal with my trauma. I didn't want to deal with my family dysfunction. I needed every way of escape, but God had to meet me to stop me. And when God meets you, you ain't gonna have no choice but to stop. And my last point, no one can resist the power of God. God is the um, uh, omnipotent God who not only judges, but he's the one who created everything. In verse 13, the Bible says, he in Amos 4, 13, uh, 13, he is here, the one who forms the mountain, creates the wind, reveals his thoughts to man, and the one who makes the dawn out of darkness and strides on the height of the earth, the Lord, the God of armies, is his name. The Bible said that he is the one that formed the mountain. See, God not only had to stop, has to stop us from progressing and pagan his influence, but he has to remind us who he is. Because sometimes we can get so caught up in the land, we get we can forget who God is. And by forgetting who God is, well, sometimes we can put man in the seat that only belongs to the Lord. God is not only the God. God is not only uh, when he, the Bible says that he who forms the mountain. And you see, Israel had to be reminded that he's the same God that brought them to the mountain when they came out of Egyptian slavery. And Exodus 19, and Exodus 19, verses three through five, where we see that when God, when Israel was coming into the recognition of who they were in the sight of God. And Exodus 19, Verses three to five, look, the Bible says, when Israel came to meet God at the mountain, the Bible says Moses went up to the mountain to God and the Lord called him from the mountain. This is what you must say to the house of Jacob and explain to the Israelites. You have seen what I did to the Egyptian and how I carried you on eagle wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you would carefully listen to me, and keep my covenant, you will be my own possession out of all the people, although the whole earth is mine. And that phrase, possession, in verse 5 in Exodus 19, Israel had to come and learn that they were God's special possession, possessor people. And that means that only God has the right to have ownership over his people. And if we allow the land to corrupt us, we will be wanting the land to have ownership over us rather than God himself. Israel had to be reminded that only God has full ownership over them. And in, in closing, he said that and reveals his thoughts to man and the one who makes the dawn out of darkness and to scribes on the heights of the earth going back to Amos 4, 13. And when, uh, the, when, the, when the Bible says that uh, he creates the wind and reveals his thoughts to man, that, that, we cannot, that we cannot keep a secret thought from the Lord. The Lord knows what we're going to think before we think it. And there's no thought that we can have that don't come back, that don't come back to God. And as I, as I close, I want to encourage us. We must challenge the pagan structure of this land. Because if we don't, we'll be in the same condition and a spiritual desensitization as Israel. And if we allow ourselves to become desensitized to the evil of the land, then we lose our spiritual sensitivity spiritual standard, we lose all spiritual love and we, uh, we, we basically lose out on the things that we're supposed to stand for. But as I close and, and uh, give this back to Brother Caruso or whoever may be facilitating, I just want to thank everybody uh, and I thank the school for this opportunity. And I hope that I was able to do uh, justice to the text. Uh, to the best of my ability, but I want to just say I'm so thankful for the SOS and I have enjoyed every minute of this lecture. Thank you, Brother Ingram, Cherokee, Alabama. 
Uh, Brother Ingram's 32 years old. I think he's still a single preacher as well. And uh, he's doing a great job in Cherokee, uh, Alabama. Uh, one of the takeaways, God had to meet me to stop me. <laughs> God had to meet me to stop me. I, I think if we would be honest, many of us would say God had to meet us to stop us. So thank you, sir, for uh, your presentation of the word of God. Closing us out is Brother Andrick Todd on tonight, on today. I, I do want to say before we introduce uh, Brother Todd, is that these messages, all of the lectures, there, there's a YouTube page dedicated to the School of Religious Studies lectures, which is separate from the School of Religious Studies. So uh, you'll be able to go back to the YouTube page and their Facebook page and see this year's lectures. You'll also be able to go back and see previous lectures on the YouTube page. So we, we, we were able to establish that uh, so that people can get familiar with uh, the page. And I think Brother, Brother Mitchell is putting that up on the screen now. But Todd, but Andrick Todd uh, was baptized into the Lord in 1995 at the Manhattan Heights Church of Christ in Lubbock, Texas. He's a veteran of the Air Force, and he's also a graduate of SRS 2019. Uh, but Todd is the current associate minister at the 15th Street Church of Christ in North Little Rock, Arkansas. I believe he works with Dean Gentry there. He also serves as the business director of the School of Religious Studies. He has been married 32 years to his wife, Letha Todd, uh, who is the great niece of the late Brother Warren Williams. We know bro Noah, Brother Williams, Warren Williams. He and his wife had three children, two daughters and a son, has a son-in-law and two grandchildren. Uh, Brother Todd is at the head of the class. Uh, when I say head of the class, uh, there have been times when the instructor has to call the student they get some information and but Todd is, is, is well prepared. I, I'm looking forward to great things from, from brother Todd. I'm saying that in my paternal and professor, professorial voice and <laughs> trying to put pressure on him as well. Uh, but he has, he has a powerful subject and he's our closeout speaker uh, for for this afternoon. We went into triple overtime, y'all. Hold your seat now, hold your seat. I know some of y'all are anxious. We're in triple overtime, but it, it's, it's, it's been great. It's been a great experience. So at this time, uh, we present to you, Rolandric Todd. Thank you, Dr. Crusoe. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? I wanna make sure my, my, my volume is coming yeah, in. Got you. Uh, wonderful. wonderful. Uh, just want to uh, take a quick moment to uh, say how blessed I am uh, to been involved with the School of Religious Studies. Uh, I, my first encounter with the School of Religious Studies was not uh, with the desire to become a preacher. Uh, Brother Harold Smith used to talk to me uh, quite often about the school. Uh, my preacher, Brother Gentry, used to talk to me quite often about the school. Uh, and my initial enrollment uh, in the school was just so I could uh, understand how to study the Bible better. But uh, if, if I could say something, I, I'm a true testament that, that uh, you don't know what God has planned for you, but you just uh, walk in faith and avail yourself to whatever it is uh, that he has for you. Uh, uh, Dr. Crusoe mentioned, uh, and, and let me say at the onset that, that, that I truly enjoyed all of the magnificent, uh, powerful, giant preachers uh, that have spoken previous to me. Uh, and it's my prayer that I'll be able to, 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 to bring it on home, if you will. Uh, my subject comes from uh, Amos chapter seven. There are 17 verses in Amos chapter seven and my focal point of my message is coming from verses 12 and 13 where the Bible says, also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thy seer, go, flee thee away into the land of Judah and there eat bread and prophesy there, but prophesy not again anymore at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel and it is the king's 
court. Under this umbrella of faith for the famine, revival and relief remedies, I want to challenge us this morning from the subject, preacher, hush your mouth. Preacher, hush your mouth. As I said earlier, I'm most certainly honored to be in such company and on such a platform with these outstanding preachers that we've all heard uh, over the past few days. You know, I, I find this whole situation kind of humorous. Uh, I envision that I'm standing in a room, a buffet with all of these big giants of preaching and they've all taken a little bit of the meat off the bone and now I'm left with just a little small crumbs to gather together and feed upon and feed those who are going to listen to me this morning. But with the help of God, I'm gonna do my best to bring something to the table. Yes, over the past days, great preachers have gotten us quite familiar with the book of Amos. Yes, they've talked about the visions of Amos, the culture surrounding Amos, the words conveyed by Amos. I, I believe we, we, we know that Amos was a country preacher from the town of Tekoa. We've, we've been made aware that he was a sheep herder and a keeper of sycamore trees. We, we heard the narrative of Amos prophesying to the nations around Israel. Oh, you nations, you're violent and you're cruel. You, you, you pagans, God is going to deal with you. We heard the words of Amos as he tells Judah, Judah, you haven't kept my laws. Remember, I'm the one who brought you out of bondage. And now you, you, you have the unmitigated gall, the nerve to follow after other gods. Judah, for three sins, yet four, God got something for you. Oh, when we get to chapter two and verse number six, Amos has a lot to say to the Northern kingdom of Israel. Oh, Israel, don't get so cheerful about God's retribution to your enemies. Don't shout, amen, see, see, Israel, understand, you gonna get this work too. Oh, you, you got a lot of money, you, you're very prosperous, but yet you trample on the poor. You deny justice to the poor to suit your own agendas. You got fathers and sons sharing the same female. And on top of that, your worship ain't about nothing. Somebody listening to me this morning. The Lord says, I hate, I despise your worship. Israel, you've become complacent. So guess what, Israel? I'm going to make sure that you pay the penalty. You're going into captivity. In other words, as I said before, Israel, you're going to get this work. When we transition to chapter 7, God shows Amos three visions. I'm going to get to where I need to be in just a moment. I'm just trying to bring us to this point. God shows Amos three visions. One of locusts, one of fire, and then one of a plumb line. As we go further in the text, we find ourselves at a pivotal point. This pivotal point is where this lesson this morning gleans. See, there's a dialogue between Amaziah and Amos. Amaziah makes a demand upon Amos and it's, it's, it's centers on where we're going this morning. Preacher, hush your mouth. But I don't want us to focus so much on that dialogue as the framework of our lesson. What is the pivotal point that I want us to see comes after the dialogue in verse 16 where Amos says, hear thou the word of the Lord. See, rather than preacher hushing your mouth, Amos continues to speak a word on behalf of the Lord. And what I want to do this morning, my charge for us this morning in contrast is that I want to impress and encourage upon my fellow beloved brethren, the men of God, in this era of disaster, in this era of disunity, in this era of distrust, yes, even spiritual destruction, in the midst of abstinence rather than obedience, sin which has become more suitable than sanctification, theology has turned into meology. I want to encourage my fellow brethren, my preachers, we must continue to speak the word 
of the Lord. Amen, somebody. Preachers, don't hush your mouth, but petition for the people. I'm not going to read through all of the verses of chapter 17, but we're going to make some points, and I'm just going to highlight it. In Amos chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, something I want us to recognize, brethren and preachers, sometimes you can't talk to folk about God, but you got to talk to God about some folk. Hello. God chose Amos in two visions how he was going to punish Israel. In each instance, Amos made petition for mercy on behalf of the people. Lord, forgive. Lord, cease, I beseech thee. But whom shall Jacob arise? For he is small. Uh, oh, man of God, we, we got to talk to God on behalf of the unrepentant sinner. We got to talk to God on behalf of the struggling saint. Even when they don't want to hear a word from God. See, 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 some people's perspective is that they're doing just fine, preacher. I don't need to hear nothing you got to say. But God has blessed us, preachers, beloved brethren, to have the kind of discernment that we can see from afar what's going on in the inside as it has been reflected on the outside. See, the struggles that may be going on with them on the inside. It's something that we have to go, go to God for on their behalf. I'm reminded of what the young preacher, Timothy, as he's being uh, exhorted by Paul, what Paul says to him in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 1. He says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, in other words, the implication of petition and giving of thanks, how, Paul, be made for all men. Something as a side note, as I look and reflect on that point, this is why we should treat the man of God with respect and love. Yes, he's petitioning God on your behalf. See, see, when Lil Buckshot and Big Head Fred get into trouble, when Mima don't look like she's going to make it, when you done cussed out Mr. Jones at the job and got fired, when you, you and old Lester been shacking up and now the lights done got turned off, you don't want to listen to the preacher on behalf of the Lord as he talks about your life. But understand, who are you going to call? You can't call Tyrone. You can't call Ghostbusters. No, you're going to call your preacher. Understand that your preacher, if he's sound, and committed to his work, is already making petition to the Lord. Lord, forgive. Lord, cease. Amen, somebody. But, but, but Amos, brethren, beloved preachers, presents for us a little bit more. Preachers, don't hush your mouth, but proclaim God's plumb line perspective. Oh, in verses Seven through nine, God shows Amos a vision of him standing up on a wall by a plumb line, made by a plumb line, excuse me, with a plumb line in his hand. See, what I need for you to see is that a plumb line was a long device, a long string with a heavy weight or metal at the end of it. And what this plumb line was used for was as they would erect a wall in preparation of a building to ensure that that wall was straight. They would hang a plumb line alongside the wall using the laws of gravity to make sure that that wall was straight. Oh, I think the Lord said something here. No matter the angle of that plumb line as it hung, gravity would always ensure that it hung straight. Lord, what are you saying? I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people. I will not again pass by them anymore. God is saying and revealing to Amos that he has a standard. You see, the plumb line is his will, his ways, and his word that are to be followed by his people. See, see, from God's plumb line perspective, Israel, which God had built up into a mighty nation, has started to lean away 
from his will and his ways and his word. In other words, they fell away from the plumb line. Preachers, we have to preach God's plumb line perspective. When there's sexual immorality, God has a plumb line perspective. Marriage between man and woman, God has a plumb line perspective. Yes, social injustices, God has a plumb line perspective. When it comes to the doctrine, God has a plumb line perspective. And, and, and here's a little news that you can use. If we want to appeal to the social injustices of society, we need to show the society what justice looks like amongst us. We want to change the world. We got to first change ourselves. Amen, Walls. Church, we need to be God's plumb line perspective people. Amen, somebody. In Amos chapter seven, in verse number 12, our lesson verse, the Bible says, also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, go flee away into the land of Judah and there eat bread and prophesy there. Scholars who view this passage suggest that the tone and nature of Amaziah was that he perceived Amos to be a professional for hire prophet. Oh, if you'll recall in the earlier part of the passage, Amaziah lied on Amos. Oh, Jer Jeroboam shall, shall die by the sword and, 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 and said what Amos didn't say about the king to support his demand for Amos to leave. Preachers, I want to encourage us this morning. We must not shut our mouths, but be a presence no matter the prejudices. See, see, it don't matter how you come across preachers. Somebody gonna lie on you. It may very well affect your influence. Some folks are not gonna believe the good things about you, but they're gonna accept the falsehoods about you. Oh, <laughs> we done heard it before. Oh, he just preaching for the money. He just worried about the money. Oh, he, he, he just wants to be known. That's why he always going and preaching everywhere. And, 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 and preachers, what I need for you to understand is when this happens, they're not gonna hear in some cases what you have to say on behalf of the Lord. See, 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 some folks won't, don't wanna hear no rebuke or no correction. Some folks are gonna say, you can't even preach. Uh, regardless, man of God, Always, on every occasion, be a presence on behalf of God. Paul says to the young preacher, Timothy, and every one of us who's been in preaching for any length of time understands this charge given to preachers as they're installed in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 2. Paul admonishes or exhorts Timothy, preach the word. How, Paul? Be instant. Wait a minute. In other words, be present. Be present on all occasions on behalf of the Lord. What occasions, Paul? In season, out of season, when they want to hear it, when they don't want to hear it. Check the false teaching. Check the misbehaving. Comfort when needed. Be patient in doing. And sometimes, preacher, sometimes, man of God, you may have to provide in-depth instruction on the will, way, and word of God. They may not like the word. They may not like or endure it. They may not like you, but preach it anyhow. Amen, someone. And finally, I'm, I'm, I'm about to land us, land us at the airport. We're about, we about to touch down. We're about to touch down. Finally, beloved brethren, and, and Dr. Crusoe, I, I hope you like this one. I hope you like this one because I had you in mind when I, when I was studying this. Finally, beloved brethren, we must not hush our mouth. Why, Brother Todd? Because somebody must proceed in preaching. Look at verses 15 through 16a. The Bible says, and the Lord took me, this is Amos talk, and the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said unto me, go prophesy unto my people Israel. Now, therefore, 
Hear thou the word of the Lord. You know, as one observes the book of Amos, one may ask the question, why did the Lord call Amos? Was it because he was diligent? Did he call him because he was dedicated? Did he call Amos because he was decisive, determined? Was it, did he call Amos because he didn't delay in prophesying God's word? He didn't delay in saying what thus saith the Lord. Scripture doesn't really give us any, any clue as to why the Lord used Amos. But what I want to encourage my brethren this morning, my beloved preachers, men of God, I want to encourage us to remember your calling. Don't be concerned with the impression of others on your ministry. Remember your calling. Some may say you have arterial motives for preaching. Remember your calling. Some might turn away from what you have said on behalf of the Lord. Remember your calling. Some may not care about social injustice. Some may not care about reverence to the almighty God. Some may not care about the state of their souls, but brethren, I'm here to tell you this morning, remember your calling. As I bring this to a close, I want to remind and encourage my beloved brethren, my men of God, with two passages of scripture and then I'm done. The first passage that I want us to remember and be encouraged by is penned by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 58. Beloved brethren, preachers, men of God, remember your calling and be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Preacher, don't hush your mouth. Remember your calling. Why? I'm reminded of Paul in Romans chapter 10 and verse number 15. Paul in part was citing from Isaiah chapter 52. Preachers, I want you to remember, as Paul says, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Preacher, don't hush your mouth. May God bless you and may God keep you as you strive to do his will. And, and let the church say amen. <laughs> all right, all right, let the church say amen. amen. Uh, very well, uh, we, we thank you, Dr. Todd or Brother Todd for presenting that message. And uh, I, I don't think Brother Ingram and Brother Todd felt as nervous uh, preaching as they did when they were in our classroom. <laughs> you know, they were always concerned about, you know, did they, get, did they make the grade and all of that. Amen uh, to them. Yeah, I, know, I heard you. I heard you. I heard you, uh, Doctor Harris. Any any anything else we need to share? Because the, the Zoom is going to cut us off in a few minutes. Any any last words? Anything? I just want to express appreciation and gratitude to everyone that attended and to all of our speakers and presenters, uh, to those that supported the event by sharing it with others, and I want to commend you, Doctor Crusoe, for uh, your fine leadership of our lecture series. Uh, you are a true uh, gentleman, a, a Christian gentleman, a ministerial gentleman, an ecclesiastical gentleman. You exemplify tremendous integrity, respect for others. You're cooperative in all aspects of our endeavor. Uh, you are encouraging and you are extremely honest in necessary conversations. And I appreciate very much uh, your leadership and what we've done here. And this is a formula for the future. And we're thankful to God it brought you our way. Thank for all of you for being here and may God bless you. Uh, join us again in our next event in, in February and look forward to being with us for our lectureship again next year. And it's my hope that Dr. Crusoe will lead us again. Well, mark on your calendar, December the 7th through the 10th. That would be the date for the 2022 lectures. Um, is Brother Braxter still on? Uh, and I, I want, if he's on, I'm going to ask him to close us out in prayer. And remember uh, those in Western Kentucky 
and um, parts of Tennessee. I, I saw, well, I haven't watched the news, but it's been on Facebook that there was a tornado. Dr. Doss, Brother Doss texted me and said he, he's been up all night. He was on our panel, but he has family in that area. And uh, so I'm sure that uh, prayer won't hurt. I shouldn't even say it like that. Prayer won't hurt. So Brother Braxter, as we close out um, on today, would you include in your prayer uh, those who live in Western Kentucky and the parts of Tennessee that were affected by this tornado. Shall we pray together? God of grace and God of glory, we are so thankful for, for this time of sharing that you have allowed us to experience over the last few days. I thank you so much, dear master, for every mouthpiece that you have used over these days to bless our hearts. And I pray that our hearts have been enlightened and enriched and overjoyed by the things that we have learned from the book of Amos. I pray that we will be challenged to take these things into our lives and make them applicable so that we can be better servants and stewards for your kingdom. Lord, we thank you for the SRS board and for the president for every staff member, uh, for every member of the SRS family. And I pray, dear master, that you would continue to use them to be a bridge and a beacon of light for your church and for your world. Father, I pray right now in a special way for those who have been affected by the storm, by the tornado, lives that have been lost, um, things that have been lost, Father, I pray for peace for those families. I pray for, for friends that have been affected by it. And dear Master, I pray that you would simply take care of them in this time. God, thank you again for this time of sharing that we have experienced. I pray that you would bless us throughout the rest of our day, throughout the rest of our lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you again. All right. God bless.